Hey everyone and welcome to this deep dive. Uh, today we're going to be talking about a story that really makes you think about how we see the world and how we see each other. It's called The Eyes Have It. it it's by Ruskin Bond. Yes. And uh, it's all about mistaken assumptions and well you'll see there's a twist. Yeah, a big twist, a really fun one. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about all of that today so let's dive in. Okay, so what's so cool about this story is how Bond, like, sets us up for this twist right from the beginning. Right away, yeah. So we see everything through the eyes of this young man who is blind, and he's alone in this train compartment. Right at the start, yeah. And so we as readers were forced to, like, experience the world through sound just like he is. Yeah, it's like we're instantly in his shoes. Exactly. You know, I, trying to I, figure I, out, like, what's going on around us just based on the sounds of the train and the conversations. And then this young woman enters the compartment. Yeah. And just the sound of her arrival, like, really gets his attention. Yeah, it's interesting how Bond describes her entrance. You hear the slapping of her slippers. And then her voice is described as having, like, this sparkle of a mountain stream. It's so vivid. So vivid, right? And so he's painting this picture of her based entirely on sound. And as readers, we start to form our own image of her too, just like he is. Yeah, and that's kind of where the irony starts to come in, right? Yes. Because he's terrified of his blindness being discovered. Right. He wants to connect with this girl, but he also like wants to maintain this facade of being sighted. And this is where we get that dramatic irony. And we as readers know that he can't see. Yeah, we know. <laughs> but she does. We're in on the secret. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so we're kind of caught up in this tension of like, will she figure it out? Right, is he going to pull this off? And Bond is playing with our expectations, setting us up for that eventual reveal. He goes to such great lengths. He does. To keep up this, at, like even making huh. up descriptions of the scenery outside the window <laughs> based on his memories. And it's kind of heartbreaking because you can sense how much he just wants to be seen as normal. Mm, you know, yeah. even though he's perfectly capable of experiencing the world in this unique way that he has. And this is where Bond uses that situational irony to kind of challenge our preconceived notions. Oh, yeah. How so? Well, we assume that, you know, the girl is judging him. Oh, right. Of course. Yeah. Just like he's worried about being judged. But the reality is far more complex than either of them realize at that point. And their conversation is so natural, you almost forget about the secret that he's keeping. Yeah, they have this great rapport. They do. They bond over their shared love of the hills. Mm -hmm. You know, especially Musuri in October. Oh, yeah. I love his description of Musuri in October. Oh, it's beautiful. It's like you can feel the crisp air and see the colorful leaves, even though he can't physically see it. Right. And that description is so important because it highlights the power of memory and imagination. Yeah. Even though he's blind, yeah. he's able to share this vivid sensory experience with with her. It proves that you don't need sight to appreciate beauty. Exactly. And then there's this playful exchange they have about her interesting face. Oh. It's so revealing. Yeah. What do you think about that? Well, he comes across as witty and a bit daring. Yeah. And she seems down to earth and genuine. I get that sense. Like yeah. there's definitely a spark between them. Even in that short time. Yeah. And Bond does such a good job of creating this intimacy between them. He does. Despite the fact that they've only just met. Yeah. And their time together is so limited. It's all about that connection. It is. It, it makes you realize that true connection, you know, it goes way beyond physical appearances. For sure. And their time together just flies by. Doesn't it? And as the train pulls into her station, she says goodbye. And the only thing left is this lingering scent of her perfume. Oh, that's such a great detail. It's like this tangible reminder yes. of their connection even after she's gone. Exactly. And it really heightens the emotional impact of the encounter for him, I think, and for us as readers, too. Yeah, it definitely sticks with you. It does. It just, when we think we're moving on from this encounter, you know, right. this new passenger enters the compartment and he just seems totally oblivious to the weight of the moment, you know? Totally. And this is where I feel like Bond starts to like tighten the knot of suspense you yeah know? you can feel it building yeah like preparing us for something unexpected something big and then the new passenger just makes this casual remark about the girl yeah he mentions how interesting she was yeah it seems like just a throwaway comment right but it's like setting the stage for this bombshell that's about to drop totally and then boom in just one sentence i know the new passenger flips the entire story on its head. Completely changes everything. He says, it was her eyes, I noticed, not her hair. She had beautiful eyes, but they were of no use to her. She was completely blind, didn't you notice? Oh my gosh, talk about a mic drop moment. Right. 
it completely changes our understanding of the whole story. Everything we thought we knew. Everything. About the characters and their interaction is suddenly like thrown up in the air. And the way he says it too. Yeah. Didn't you notice? So blunt, so blunt and casual, and it just amplifies the shock. Oh, God. Not only is the young man blindsided. Right. But we are too, as readers. Yeah, we're right there with him. And Bond, I mean, he just masterfully uses this twist to expose all these layers of irony mm -hmm. and to really challenge our perceptions. We're going to unpack all that. We are. Right after this quick break. Yeah. I mean, that twist, it's not just there for like shock value. No, it's not just a gimmick. Right. It really makes us like confront the limitations of our own perception yeah totally we like the young man we just assumed that the girl was sighted right we built this whole image of her in our minds based on the sounds and his description we fill in the blanks ourselves we do and yeah. we miss this like crucial part of her identity and it's such a brilliant use of dramatic irony because we're in on the young man's secret right we're feeling that tension of his charade but then bond flips the script yeah and reveals that the girl had a secret of her own right and that completely changes the dynamic of their whole encounter. It makes you think, like, how often do we make assumptions about people? Yeah. Based on what we see or what we think we see. All the time. Yeah. And we might miss out on these deeper connections. Absolutely. Because we're so focused on outward appearances. Yeah. And the irony gets even deeper when you realize that both characters were worried about being judged for their blindness. Right. They both have this shared experience. But they approach it in such different ways. Yeah. The young man is so preoccupied with concealing it. Uh-huh. But the girl is clearly comfortable with it. Yeah, she owns it. She does. And she even brushes off his comment about the scenery outside. Right. Like something that would have made a sighted person pause. Yeah, that's such a subtle but important detail. It is, because it shows a difference in their experiences. Right. The young man sees his blindness as something to hide, uh -huh. but the girl has just accepted it as part of who she is. It makes you wonder if her comfort with her own blindness made her more perceptive to his. Oh, interesting. Yeah, maybe she sensed his hesitation. Right. His reliance on sound. Yeah. But she chose to play along. It's possible. And allowed him to keep his dignity. Yeah, that adds a whole other layer to the story. It does. Suggesting this like empathy and understanding between them that goes beyond words. And it also reminds us that sometimes silence can be just as powerful as speech. Absolutely. The story really makes you question, like, what it means to truly see someone. Yeah. Do we ever really see beyond the surface? Yeah, you know? it's hard. It is. Are we constantly just filtering our perceptions through our own assumptions and biases? It's like Bond is urging us to move beyond those superficial judgments. Yeah. And engage with the world and the people in it on a deeper, more empathetic level. And speaking of deeper engagement, yeah. I want to go back to Bond's use of sound in this story. Right. It's not just a clever way to tell a story from a blind person's perspective. It's more than that. It's like this powerful tool for creating a vivid emotional experience. For all readers. For everyone, yeah, yeah. whether you're sighted or not. Yeah, sound becomes a central character in the story. It does. Think about the rhythmic chugging of the train. Uh huh? The sparkle of the girl's voice, yeah. the way her slippers slapped against the platform, uh -huh. these details create such an immersive experience. They do. It's like you're right there in the train compartment with them. And that lingering scent of her perfume. Yeah. It's not just a detail. Right. It's like this sensory echo of their connection. It is. Even though she's physically gone, her presence lingers. It highlights that impact she had on him. Exactly. And yeah. Bond elevates sound you know, beyond mere description. Yeah. It becomes a way to explore the characters' emotions, their connection, the fleeting nature of their encounter. And it makes you appreciate the power of sound in our own lives. It does. We often take it for granted. We do. But it shapes our experiences, evokes memories, connects us to the world around us. In ways that we don't even realize. Think about the sound of your favorite song. Yeah. The laughter of a loved one, the calming rhythm of rain. Those sounds stay with us. We do. They shape our memories, influence our moods, create a sense of place and time. Bond's story reminds us to pay attention to the soundscape of our lives. Yeah. To appreciate the richness and complexity of the world as we hear it. So we've got this incredible twist that makes us question our assumptions. Right. And this masterful use of sound that immerses us in the story. Yeah. What does it all mean for us? What's the takeaway? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How can we take these insights from the story and actually apply them to our own lives? That's the key question, isn't it? It is. Oh. How can we learn to truly see the people around us? 
Well, I think the story gives us this really powerful framework for like cultivating empathy. Okay. You know, it starts with recognizing our own biases. Yeah. Those preconceived notions that we all carry around about the world. Right. We all have them. We do. But being aware of them, that's the first step to moving beyond them. Exactly. It's like Bond is holding up a mirror. Yeah. And showing us how quickly we jump to conclusions. Based on very limited information. Yeah. You know, the young man assumed the girl was judging him, just like we assumed she was sighted. Exactly. And those assumptions, they prevent us from truly seeing each other. They do. So it's a reminder to be more present in our interactions. You know, yeah. to listen more intently. Tea in the moment. Yeah, and to observe with an open mind. I like that. Instead of letting our assumptions fill in the blanks. Right. What if we just ask more questions? Yeah. And try to understand different perspectives. And that's where the power of listening comes in. Absolutely. Not just passively hearing words. Right. But actively engaging with what's being said and what's not being said. That's so important. And like in the story, sometimes the most meaningful communication. Yeah happens in the silences you know it does in that unspoken understanding between two people i think so and sometimes that understanding comes from shared experiences oh yeah you know in the story both characters are navigating the world with blindness but they approach it in these different ways uh-huh you know the young man's afraid of being judged yeah but the girl has embraced it she has recognizing those shared human experiences mm -hmm. even if they manifest in different ways can help us connect on a deeper level that's a good point. It's about finding those common threads, those universal emotions and experiences that unite us despite our differences. I like that. You know, we all long for connection, for understanding, for acceptance. We do. And recognizing that in others can help us move beyond those superficial judgments. Right. And build more meaningful relationships. Absolutely. So we've talked about recognizing our biases, listening more intently, finding common ground. Okay. What are some practical ways we could apply these insights in our everyday lives? Well, I think it starts with symbol awareness. Okay. Paying attention to how we react to people uh -huh. and situations. Right. Do we find ourselves making snap judgments based on appearances? Right. Are we really listening to what others have to say? Yeah. Or are we just waiting for our turn to speak? That's a good question. It is. To ask yourself. It's also about challenging our assumptions. Yeah. You know, yeah. if we find ourselves jumping to conclusions, yeah. asking ourselves, like, why am I thinking this? Mm -hmm. What experiences or biases are influencing my perception? I like that. You know, being willing to question our own thought patterns mm -hmm. is key to breaking down those barriers to empathy. I agree. And don't underestimate the power of curiosity. Oh, yeah. Approaching interactions with a genuine desire to learn about someone's experiences. Yeah, their perspective. Their story. Yeah. You know, asking open-ended questions, actively listening to their responses, mm -hmm. and being open to having our own views challenged. That's huge. It is, you know, this story reminds us that there's always more than meets the eye. Right. Or in this case, the ear. Yes. True seeing goes beyond physical sight. Absolutely. It's about perceiving the world with an open heart and mind. Yeah. Seeking connection and understanding in every interaction. I love that. It's a lifelong practice. It is. A journey of self-discovery and connection with others. And like any journey, it begins with a single step. Exactly. And maybe today, that step could be reaching out to someone you don't know well. Yeah. Asking them about their day and truly listening to their response. I think that's a great place to start. So as we wrap up this deep dive into the eyes have it. Yeah. I'm left with this sense of gratitude for the power of stories. Me too. To challenge our perceptions and open our hearts. They can do that. They can. And I'm reminded that true connection. Yeah. It starts with being willing to see beyond the surface and listen with empathy. Absolutely. That's it for this deep dive. We hope you enjoyed the journey. Thanks for listening, everyone. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep an open mind. We're going to be looking at the early life of a pretty amazing guy. Hmm. Um, APJ Abdul Kalam. Yes. And you probably know him, at least I know him, as a uh, as a brilliant scientist. I mean... An aerospace engineer. Yeah, aerospace engineer, and then later they're president of India. That's right. But um, today, we're going to go even deeper. Yeah. We're going to look back into his childhood. His roots. Yeah, and the influences, especially from his parents, uh -huh. that really shaped who he became. Yeah, this is going to be a fascinating one, I think. Yeah, I'm really excited about this one. Me too. So... um. 
The source material today is an excerpt from his autobiography, right. Wings of Fire. Yep. And the excerpt is titled Strong Roots. Strong Roots, yeah. Yeah. Which is very fitting uh, yeah. for what we're talking about. It is. Really looking at the early life of this extraordinary individual and yeah. you know how those those early influences um, helped shape him. So this excerpt kind of takes us right into his childhood home. It does. In Ramaswaram. Mm -hmm. And he describes this uh, this large traditional house on, yeah. and this is interesting, Mosque Street, right. in this town where Hindu and Muslim communities... Uh, Live side by side. Yeah, just all mixed together. So yeah. right away, you're getting this picture of... A very brave verse. Yeah, a diverse community, mm -hmm. a very inclusive community. Right. Um, and one of the things that I found so interesting is the contrast that he paints between his father's, um, like, I don't know, personal austerity. Yeah, almost like a simplicity. Yeah, simplicity. and But then also these, generosity. the generosity. Mm -hmm. that, that was just permeating their entire household. Exactly. So his father, Janie Labdeen, believed in a very simple life, like no excessive luxury or anything like that, but their <laughs> doors were always open. Always. And he says that there were countless people sharing meals with them all the time. I mean... More outsiders and family, he says. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't even catch that. Yeah, he says more outsiders eating with them than family members. I mean, that just speaks volumes about... The kind of atmosphere? Yeah, the atmosphere he grew up in. Yeah, very open, welcoming. I mean, you can just imagine. Oh, absolutely. Like, I, I was reading this, and I could almost smell the aroma of... Yes. You can practically smell it. The sambar and the homemade pickles. And picture him as this little kid yeah. eating with his mother on the kitchen floor, which is interesting, too. Yeah, that's a detail. Yeah. The kitchen floor. You don't see too often these days. No. And then, and then seeing his father... Uh, coming back from the coconut grove with all those coconuts. Over his shoulder? Yeah, over his shoulder. I mean, it's just such a... It's a beautiful image. Yeah, it's like a beautiful... And it really sets the scene for yeah. life in Ramaswaram at the time. Yeah. This town with this beautiful blend of cultures. Right. The Shiva temple and the mosque mm -hmm. standing in such close proximity. It's just like this intermingling of faiths yeah. woven into the fabric of everyday life. Yeah, you don't really see that too much. It's special. No. Yeah. You know, especially in those days. Right. Um, so this this whole atmosphere, this harmonious environment, really played a, a key role, it sounds like, in shaping his understanding oh, so of, yeah, of faith and spirituality. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, there's this one part where he talks about going with his father yes. for evening prayers at the mosque. Right. And, and he said he didn't understand the Arabic, mm -hmm. but he still felt this like, deep connection yeah the sense of belonging yeah just being just being present in that yeah. space yeah i thought that was pretty cool that you don't have to yeah necessarily understand everything to to feel connected yeah to feel connected mm -hmm. and another thing is how he talks about the respect oh the respect his father commanded was incredible yeah especially from people of all faiths yeah and he even says that people would wait for his father after prayers yeah i bring bowls of water for him to bless yeah and they believed that th that water would heal he would heal their sick relatives i mean that's it's a powerful testament that's a powerful statement to the trust and reverence he inspired it really is like people really believed in him yeah and his and his blessings yeah and his connection to to something greater yeah yeah that was a really that was a detail that really it stuck with me too it stuck with me yeah. yeah it shows that that he kind of transcended these religious boundaries he did and earned that kind of uh you know respect respect and trust yeah absolutely from everybody and then there's also this great story about his father's close friendship with pashi lakshmana sastri oh yeah the high priest of the ramaswaram temple yeah the high priest imagine these two deep in conversation you know I know. Discussing matters of faith and spirituality. It's just this beautiful testament to the power of dialogue and I mean, you, understanding. It really sets the stage for, for the kind of spiritual lessons that yeah. Kalam learned from his father. Yeah. It wasn't just about, you know, yeah. abstract theological concepts. It was about yeah. this practical wisdom mm -hmm. that was just woven into daily life. Exactly. It was like real world stuff, you know, like... Yeah. um for instance, how his father viewed prayer. Right. He didn't see it as just some kind of... Empty ritual. Yeah, just some empty ritual. Yeah. He saw it as... Um, a way to connect. A way to connect with something. With something bigger. Bigger than himself. Yeah. yeah. He said, when you pray, you transcend your body and become a part of the cosmos. Whoa. 
which knows no division of wealth, age, caste, or creed. Hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah, I thought that was... I love that quote. Yeah, pretty powerful. It's a really powerful expression yeah. of a kind of universal spirituality, you know? Yeah. It's a, a sense of unity. Yeah. It goes beyond the confines of any one religion. Right. It's about connecting with the deeper truth Yeah. that resides within us all. And it's interesting how this whole idea of looking inward, that comes up again when he talks about his father's approach to, like adversity mm. yeah. like his father didn't see suffering as something to be avoided or mm. something to blame on other people exactly it was more like a chance to learn and grow yeah like an opportunity yeah for introspection mm. to really look inside yourself right instead of pointing fingers outward his dad was more about yeah find the quote enemy of fulfillment unquote yeah. within oh wow i like that yeah it's about taking responsibility yeah. for your own growth uh -huh. And understanding that even these difficult experiences yeah. can actually lead to transformation. Yeah, that's a powerful message. It is. Especially today, I think, where it's so easy to blame everything else. Oh, absolutely. Everyone else's fault. Right. Yeah. So it's like, it makes you think, you know? <laughs> yeah. What was the last challenge you faced? Mm -hmm. Did you look at it as a chance to learn? Right. Or did you just immediately blame someone or something else? Right. Yeah. Are you playing the victim? Yeah. Or are you taking ownership? Right. And I think Kalam's father is really pushing this idea that you got to... Face challenges head on. Yeah. Own your part in them. Mm-hmm. That's how and you grow. That's how you grow. And that whole idea of inner strength. Yes. And resilience. It's something that you can just tell. It resonated with Kalam. Yeah. Throughout his life. And then... There's this other part that really got me. It was about his father's work ethic. Oh, yeah. Talk about dedication. It's, I mean, can you imagine waking up at four every day? Every day. Starting with prayer and then walking four miles. Four miles. To the coconut grove. Before breakfast. I know. That's crazy. Before breakfast. It's incredible. I mean, he was committed. Yeah. And, you know, it makes sense when you see how. It inspired Colum. Yeah, it totally yeah. did. Like his own pursuit of scientific knowledge. Right. His dedication to uncovering these fundamental truths. Yeah. That was all connected. It's like he was following in his father's footsteps. In a way, yeah. But instead of a spiritual quest, it was... A scientific one. Yeah, but it's almost like both of them were driven by this... Uh, a yearning for understanding. Yeah, this deep need to understand. The world around them. Yeah, and then in the end, he talks about this divine power mm. that can guide us towards our true purpose and bring us freedom and happiness and peace of mind it's a beautiful thought it is and it's interesting because even in this world of science and technology right there's still that room for faith yeah for that sense of something bigger yeah something larger than ourselves guiding us on our journey yeah i really like that me too makes you think huh like, what are those values that, that we all got instilled in us right. when we were kids? Maybe even without us realizing it. Right, right. Yeah. What are those uh, those lessons from our upbringing mm -hmm. that still guide us today? You know, and for me, one of the, the most important things that comes through in in Kalam's story mm -hmm. is this idea that uh, that real greatness isn't about, like... yeah status or you know, achievements yeah. like those external markers of success no, right right it's more about the values the values like Vicety, integrity goes, compassion uh, compassion that willingness to serve others all those things that that his father embodied embodied yeah and and passed on to him it's that that inner strength yes and and that connection to uh something bigger than ourselves yeah exactly and letting those things Guide our actions. Yeah, guide our actions. And that's something that... Anyone can do. Anyone can do. Yeah. Regardless of your background or your circumstances. And, you know, I think Kalam's story is really a, a powerful example of that. It is. You know, he came from very humble beginnings. Mm -hmm. And he achieved these extraordinary things. Yeah, he was... A, through a, hard work. And, an incredible individual. Yeah, really inspiring. And if, if anybody out there is... Uh, Interested in learning more about his journey? Wings of Fire, yeah. Yeah, Wings of Fire, his autobiography. Great read. It's, uh, I haven't read the whole thing, but this excerpt alone has been really uh, inspiring. It's a powerful story. Yeah, it's been a great deep dive, I think. Me too. Into the roots of uh, this remarkable man. Absolutely. And uh, hopefully uh, the folks listening out there will 
Find some inspiration too. Yeah, find some inspiration and um, you know, reflect a little bit on on maybe the influences in their own lives. Yeah, the people who have shaped them. Yeah, and how maybe they can uh, shape others as well. Pay it forward. Yeah, pay it forward. That's a good way to put it. We'll uh, we'll catch you next time. Until then, keep exploring, keep learning, and keep those deep dives going. Absolutely. All right, let's dive in. Today we're going deep with just one story. Just one story. Yes, one story, yep. Thank you, ma'am. By Langston Hughes. Langston Hughes, that's right. And we're hoping to find some big truths about, well, human nature. Human nature. Empathy, things like that. Exactly. Langston Hughes, we know him from his poetry. That source is poetry, yeah. But he was a master of the short story as well. Oh, absolutely. And often he would draw on... Um, you know, African folk culture, That's true, inspiration like, and themes and things like that. And this particular story, I think what's so great about Thank You, Ma'am, is that it just throws us right into the action. It does. You know, it's a late at night, about 11 o'clock. Okay. Mrs. Jones is walking home, probably thinking about her day. Yeah. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this boy tries to snatch her purse. Yeah. And it's uh, Hughes describes it as a purse that has everything in it but hammer and nails. Oh, wow. So you just picture that? Mm -hmm. This woman alone at night? Wow. Bam! This kid comes flying at her. Yeah. Yeah, but Mrs. Jones is not... She's not messing around. She's not a pushover, no. No, she's not. Uh... Hughes describes the boy being thrown off balance by the weight of the purse. Oh, wow. So he ends up flat on his back. Okay. And Mrs. Jones, she doesn't hesitate. She gives him a swift kick. She kicks him. She does. Wow. And it's important here to note the power dynamic that's being set up right from the start. Okay. Mrs. Jones is described as a large woman, while the boy is uh, described as frail and willow wild. Frail and willow wild. It's clear that she has the upper hand, both physically and in this uh in this particular situation. Yeah, she definitely does. But then instead of calling for help or, you know, turning him over to the police or whatever, she yeah. she does something unexpected. Totally. She demands, ain't you ashamed of yourself? Mm. And the boy immediately lies. Oh, yeah, he does. He says, I didn't aim to. Which is interesting because this lie, I think, opens a window into the boy's psychology. You know, Hughes, the master of inner turmoil, leaves us to ponder. Is the boy afraid? Afraid. Trying to protect his pride. Is he desperate to avoid any further consequences? Interesting. We're left kind of wondering about that. And Mrs. Jones, she's not letting him go. No. She knows he's lying. She sees right through him. She sees right through it, yeah. And in fact, she tells him, you know, straight up that he is lying. Yeah. And then she literally drags him along with her. This woman's taking charge. This woman is in charge. Yes, she is. And this is, I think, this is a real turning point in the story, right? This is it. Instead of just resorting to punishment, right? she chooses to engage with him. Exactly. She tells him, you ought to be my son. I would teach you right from wrong. Such a great line. It's such a powerful statement about, about her character, you know, yeah. about her willingness to, like, take responsibility for someone else's well-being. Yes. Absolutely. And, you know, I thought it was interesting that she doesn't pry into his life. She doesn't judge him. She doesn't, you know, wh where do you live or well, what's your family like or anything? She just mm, takes him home. Takes him home with her. Yeah. And when they arrive, Hughes describes her room as being open to the rest of the house. Okay. So you hear sounds of other people around. Oh, interesting. It's not a place of isolation or punishment, but rather one of warmth and community. Interesting. She okay. makes him wash his face. Mm -hmm. But then think about this. She leaves her purse, the very one he tried to steal on the daybed, completely unattended. Wow, I didn't even think about that. It's a bold move, right? Yeah, considering what just happened, yeah. But this seemingly small act, I think, speaks volumes about Mrs. Jones's philosophy. Okay. She believes in restorative justice. She believes in offering a chance for redemption rather than simply punishing wrongdoing. Yeah. And it raises a really important question for all of us, you know. What's up? How often do we allow for second chances? How often do we choose understanding over retribution? It really makes you think. It does. But the boy, he's, you know, he's clearly still on edge. He asks her. Oh, yeah, he's nervous. You're going to take me to jail. And her response is hilarious. Oh, what does she say? She says, not with that face. I would not take you nowhere. Okay. Now, she's not just talking about his physical appearance here. I think she's acknowledging his vulnerability. Right. His fear. She sees him. She sees him. 
and she disarms him with a bit of humor. But then she does something that reveals a lot about the boy's situation, I think. What does she do? She asks him if he's had supper. Oh. Uh, and he tells her, no, there's nobody home. And you start to realize that maybe, just maybe, his actions were driven by desperation. Yeah. By basic needs. You know, a need for food, maybe. That's right. Yeah. And that's when he confides in her about wanting blue suede shoes. These shoes. Yeah, it seems like such a simple desire. But in the context of his situation, it mm -hmm. becomes incredibly poignant. This is where I think the story gets really interesting because she could have just scolded him oh, totally. for trying to steal to get the shoes. Right. But Mrs. Jones does something completely different. She does, yeah. Instead of lecturing him, she sits him down and she opens up about her own past. That's right. And she tells him that she too has done things she's not proud of. It's so powerful. You know, things that she wouldn't even tell God. Wow. And I think it's this moment of vulnerability that really creates a deeper connection between them, you know? It really does. It shows the boy that she's not perfect, that she understands his struggles. And it's through this shared humanity, right, that she really connects with him. Exactly. By revealing her own flaws, her own past mistakes, she levels the playing field. Yeah. And she creates this space for genuine empathy. Yeah. She's not talking down to him. She's meeting him where he is. And I think that's what makes her act of kindness so powerful. Yeah, I agree. It's not about charity or pity. It's about recognizing the shared human experience that we all have. Precisely. And it's about seeing beyond the immediate transgression. Right. Beyond the labels of victim and offender. Yeah. And recognizing that complex web of circumstances that can lead someone to make a bad choice. It really makes you think about how we often just jump to judgment. You know, Whoa. without truly understanding the motivations behind someone's actions. Yes. And Hughes really challenges us to consider, you know. Consider what? What if, instead of immediately condemning, we took the time to understand? Mm. What if we offered a hand up instead of pushing someone further down? Yeah, it's a challenging question. It is. But one that I think is worth asking. Absolutely. And, you know, this theme of second chances, we see it echoed in the way Mrs. Jones sets the boy free at the end of the story. Oh, yeah, for sure. She doesn't try to control his future, you know? Uh, she trusts him to make his own choices. It's such a profound act of faith, I think. It is, yeah. It speaks to this belief in the inherent goodness of people. Right. This yeah. belief that even those who have stumbled can find their way back to a better path. I was thinking it's interesting to consider how this story might have been different if it had been told from the boy's perspective. Hmm. That's a fascinating thought. Yeah. What might we learn about his life, his family, you know, his internal struggles? Right, exactly. What led him to that moment of desperation? It's a testament to Hughes's artistry, I think. Absolutely. That he leaves these questions open, you know, inviting yeah. us to imagine, to empathize, to fill in the gaps with our own understanding of human nature. And that's the ultimate power of literature. I think so, yeah. It allows us to step outside ourselves. Yeah. To see the world through different eyes, to mm -hmm. confront our own biases and assumptions. And it can be a catalyst for personal growth, right? Absolutely. And a reminder of that shared humanity that we've been talking about. Definitely. So as we wrap up this exploration of this incredible story, mm -hmm. I'm left with this question. What can we as individuals do mm -hmm. to create a world where compassion and understanding are more prevalent? Mm. It really is mm. the heart of it. Yeah. How could we like in our daily lives, you know, actually be like Mrs. Jones? I mean... It's hard, right? Yeah. The world feels, I don't know, so quick to judge, so quick to condemn. Did, uh, but this story, thank you, ma it's like this hopeful little, uh, you know. Glimmer of hope. A glimmer of hope, that's it. Yeah. That even small acts of kindness. Can make a difference. Can make a difference, yeah. They have a ripple effect. I think it also reminds us that we're all capable of both good and bad. That's yeah, true. I mean, even Mrs. Jones, she says, you know, she did things she wasn't proud of. Right. It's a reminder that none of us are perfect. Yeah, we all... We all make mistakes. Make bad choices sometimes. Yes, yeah, yeah. And I think by doing that, by acknowledging her own imperfections, that's how she makes space for the boy to, you know... To open up. To be vulnerable. Yeah. To, like, let go of his defenses a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it's like, true connection can only come when we're, like real with each other you know absolutely when we're honest about our own struggles too for me one of the most powerful things about this story is how it ends how it ends yeah we don't know what happens to this boy right like did he buy the shoes did he turn his life around did he go back to his old ways we don't know 
Hughes just leaves it up to us. And I think that's what makes it so powerful, you know? It is. It makes you think. It makes you think, yeah. It forces us to confront, uh, I don't know, like the uncertainty of life, I guess. Right. The fact that we just don't know what's going to happen. It, you can offer kindness, but you can't control what people do with it, right? Right, exactly. It's uh, like she plants a seed, but... But she can't control if it grows. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, she can just create the right conditions and hope for the best. And that's that's true for a lot of things, I think. It is. We can't control other people's choices, but we can control how we act. How we respond. Yeah, you know, whether yeah. we choose compassion. Whether we choose to be understanding. This deep dive into, thank you, ma'am. It's been Hello. really powerful, yeah. It's reminded us about how complex people are. Yeah. And the importance of second chances. And how strong compassion can be. You know, it's a story that makes you think. It really does. Long after you finish reading it. Yeah. It makes you think about how you treat other people, mm -hmm. how you react to, uh, I don't know, people who are struggling, people who are making bad choices. And maybe how we could all be a little more understanding. A little more forgiving. Yeah, a little more like Mrs. Jones. Exactly. So as we wrap up, we'll leave you with this thought. Okay. What small act of kindness could you do today? You know, something inspired by Mrs. Jones. Mm. And how could you, in your own way, help create a world where empathy and compassion are the rule, not the exception? That's something to think about. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive. Welcome to the deep dive. Today, uh, we're going to be tackling Tolstoy. Oh. Three questions. Okay. It's a story that's uh, deceptively simple, but... It manages to pack in some seriously big questions about uh, how we live our lives. Yeah, it's just fascinating how he takes these almost like universal anxieties, you know, when to act, who matters most, what to prioritize, and weaves them into this story that still resonates, you know, all these years later. Right, and he does it through this parable about a czar. Right. Who's facing, let's call it an existential crisis of leadership. Yeah. Um, this guy's desperate for answers to the point of offering a reward to anyone who can solve these riddles for him. Oh, wow. And you can imagine the range of advice that he gets. Oh, yeah. Some people are all about schedules, planning everything down to the minute yeah. to make sure you're acting at the right time. Like a tight ship. Yeah. Gotta have a plan. Sounds exhausting, honestly. Yeah. Like you'd never actually get anything done for fear of missing the optimal moment. Exactly. And then you have the other extreme. The folks saying the czar needs to be constantly on alert, just reacting to whatever pops up. Oh, so like a firefighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always waiting for the next emergency. And exactly. Okay, so you got, on one hand... Rigid planning. Rigid planning, and on the other, pure reactivity. Yeah. Neither seems particularly sustainable. Not really. And then, of course, you have the folks who think the answer lies in having the right people around you. Right. Wise advisors, powerful allies. Yes. But even then, who are the most important? Who should you listen to? Yeah, the debate rages on. For sure. Okay, so no easy answers there. Nope. What about the question of what matters most? Right. The thing the czar should truly focus on. Uh-huh. I bet that got even more philosophical. Oh, absolutely. You have champions for science, for warfare, for religious devotion, each arguing that their area is the key to a successful reign. And the poor czar is probably just getting more and more confused with every new piece of advice. Right. It's almost like Tolstoy is showing us the trap of seeking these big definitive answers. Absolutely. It is. And it's at this point overwhelmed by all this conflicting advice that the czar decides to take a different approach. Okay. He seeks out a hermit Ooh. who's known for his wisdom, someone completely removed from all of these palace intellectual circles. Well, this is where things take a turn, right? Yes. This is where it gets good. Because this hermit isn't what the czar expects at all. Not in the slightest when the czar arrives all pomp and circumstance. Yeah. Ready for some, you know, profound pronouncements. He finds the hermit digging in his garden. Magicians. Yeah. Serious. Yeah. That's where the czar went with this. Well, in a way, it makes sense. If you believe knowing the future is the key to everything, why not consult someone who claims to have that power? I guess so. But it really highlights how desperate the czar is for a clear-cut solution. Yeah. Even if it comes from magic. Absolutely. So what's the hermit's reaction to all of this? Yeah. Is he impressed by the czar's visit? Not particularly. He acknowledges the czar politely, but continues digging. This is a man who clearly prioritizes action over words. What a contrast. Yeah. The czar obsessed with finding these grand answers. Right. And the hermit focused on the simple 
practical task at hand. Right in front of him. It's such a powerful image and I think a real turning point in the story. It is, and it leads to this really pivotal moment. Okay. The czar, perhaps humbled by the hermit's lack of fawning, offers to help with the digging. So he's literally getting his hands dirty in search of wisdom. That's right. I love that. Yeah. What happens next? So... Does the hermit finally offer some profound insights while they're digging side by side? Not exactly. Remember, this is a parable, so the lessons are revealed through actions, not yeah. lectures. Okay. So while they're working, a wounded man stumbles out of the woods. This is where it gets really interesting. It is. This man turns out to be the czar's sworn enemy, someone who has been plotting revenge. Wow. So the simple act of digging potentially saved the czar's life. It really did. It makes you think about all the unexpected ways our actions can have consequences, doesn't it? Absolutely. And this is just the beginning of how Tolstoy starts answering those three big questions through the events of the story. This feels like a good place to pause. Okay. We've set the scene. Yeah. We've met our main players. We have. And things are about to get really interesting. They are. Welcome back. Last time we left off with the czar and the hermit, you know, face to face with the czar's would-be assassin. Right. And it's so interesting how this seemingly random encounter becomes the key to unlocking those answers to the czar's three big questions. It really is. So instead of reacting with, you know, anger or fear, what does the czar do? Right. He chooses compassion. He helps the hermit tend to the man's wounds mm -hmm. and cares for him throughout the night. It's such a powerful moment. This man intent on harming the czar is met with you know, kindness and care. Right. Speaks volumes about the Tsar's character, doesn't it? It does. And it really highlights the central theme of the story, which is the transformative power of compassion. You see, this act of mercy has a profound effect on the wounded man. He's overwhelmed with remorse and begs for the Tsar's forgiveness. And the Tsar being a good guy deep down forgives him, right? He does, absolutely. He not only forgives him, but agrees to restore the man's property. It's yeah. a beautiful example of how choosing compassion, even when it's difficult, can lead to reconciliation and healing. It makes you wonder if the Tsar would have reacted the same way if he hadn't spent that time with the hermit, focused on simple tasks and getting away from all the palace drama. That's a great point. It's almost as if that time spent, you know, digging and reflecting prepared the Tsar for this very moment. Yeah, okay, so the enemy is forgiven, everyone's feeling good, yeah. and the Tsar, having just had a near-death experience and a life-changing act of forgiveness, goes back to those burning questions. Exactly. He returns to the hermit, hoping for, you know, some kind of explanation, a clear breakdown of what it all means. Yeah. And what's so fascinating is that the hermit, in his characteristically subtle way, uh -huh. points out that the Tsar has already been answered. So the answers weren't in some grand philosophical treatise, but in the lived experience. Exactly. The hermit simply guides the czar to connect the dots. He says, look, if you hadn't stayed to help me dig, you would have encountered your enemy and likely been killed. So the most important time was when you were digging, and the most important person was me, the one you were helping. Wow, it's so simple yet so profound. Right. It reminds me of that saying, wherever you are, be all there. Yes. It's about being present in the moment mm. and recognizing the importance of whoever is right there with you. It is. And then think about the arrival of the wounded man. Suddenly, the most important time becomes the moment the czar chooses to show compassion and the most important person becomes the one needing his help. So the answers aren't static. Mm -hmm. They're dynamic. They shift depending on the circumstances. It's back. Tolstoy is like challenging this whole idea that we can have these one-size-fits-all answers to life's big questions. It's a powerful reminder that life is full of these unexpected turns and our ability to adapt and respond with compassion is so crucial. What stands out to you about the hermit's emphasis on the present moment being the most important? Well, it's such a relevant message for us today, isn't it? Yeah. We're constantly bombarded with distractions pulled in a million different directions. Right. The hermit's words remind me of the importance of mindfulness, of focusing on what's right in front of us right. rather than getting lost in, you know, worries about the past or future. It reminds me a lot of modern productivity advice about focusing on the most important task at hand mm. rather than getting bogged down by like endless to-do lists. Oh, yeah. Tolstoy was way ahead of his time. He was. But what about the czar's third question? Right. The one about the most important thing to do. Yeah. How does the hermit address that one? The hermit's answer to that is perhaps the most simple yet the most challenging of all to do good to the person in front of you. Mm. He states that this is the very purpose for which man was sent into this life. Such a beautiful concept. Yeah. 
But it requires a real shift in perspective, doesn't it? it We're so often caught up in our own goals and ambitions. Yeah. That we forget about the needs of those around us. It's true. But the hermit reminds us that every interaction, even those that seem insignificant, has the potential for good. So it's not about waiting for some grand opportunity to like make a difference. Right. It's about looking for those everyday moments where we can show kindness, yeah. offer support, or simply just lend a listening ear. And who knows what ripple effect those small acts might have. Exactly. It makes you think twice about rushing through your day, ignoring the people you encounter. Right. What does it mean to do good to the barista making your coffee, the person you're sitting next to on the bus? Right. Your colleagues, your family. Those are powerful questions to consider. And I think Tolstoy is suggesting that the answers will be different for each of us. Right. It's about being aware of the needs around us and responding with compassion and authenticity. It's like he's saying that the answers to life's biggest questions aren't out there in some, you know, distant mystical realm. Right. They're right here woven into the fabric of our everyday interactions. Yeah, that's a really empowering thought, isn't it? It is. We don't need to be a czar or, you know, go on some epic quest right. to find meaning and purpose. It's about finding those opportunities for connection and good in the most ordinary moments. So maybe we don't all need to find a hermit in the woods to guide us. Right. Although a walk in nature and some quiet reflection probably wouldn't hurt. Definitely not. But Tolstoy's point is that these truths, these insights into how to live a meaningful life are accessible to all of us. Right. They're not hidden in some, you know, ancient text or reserved for the elite. Yeah. They're revealed through our experiences, our interactions, the choices we make each day. It's like that saying, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. Right. The second best time is now. Yes. We can get so caught up in waiting for the right moment or the perfect conditions that we miss out on the opportunities that are right in front of us. Exactly. And I think that's one of the most powerful takeaways from three questions. It's a call to action. An invitation to stop overthinking and start living to engage with the present moment, connect with the people around us, and strive to do good in whatever way we can. It's a reminder that life isn't some abstract concept or a problem to be solved. It's a series of moments, each one filled with potential. And those moments, as Tolstoy so beautifully illustrates, are where we find true wisdom, meaning, and purpose. So there you have it, folks. A deep dive into Tolstoy's three questions. A story that's both timeless and timely. It is. Urging us to consider how we're choosing to spend our precious time and who we're prioritizing in our lives. It's a reminder that the present moment is all we truly have and that even the smallest acts of kindness and connection can have a ripple effect, creating a more compassionate and meaningful world. Tolstoy leaves us with a powerful challenge to embrace the now, to recognize the importance of those around us, and to strive to do good in whatever way we can. May we all be inspired to take that challenge to heart. And on that note, thanks for joining us for another deep dive. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep connecting. All right, let's jump into something a little different today. <laughs> We're going meta, folks. Like deep dive on deep dive, kind of meta. Sounds interesting. We're diving deep into another podcast's take on a poem. Okay, which one? It's called On Killing a Tree. On Killing a Tree. Yep. Huh. By a poet named Giv Patel. I'm intrigued. So the podcast we're looking at today is Roots and Branches. Ah. They uh, they explore environmental poetry, which is right up our alley. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, well, this poem, Yeah. it's not your typical walk in the park kind of nature poem. Sounds a little ominous on killing a tree. Right. It's surprisingly brutal. Really? Yeah, but the way the violence is described, mm. it's so calm, almost clinical. Mm. It's like, whoa, what's going on here? It really hooks me. So, so what's the poem about? Well, before we get to what the other podcast said, right. what, what jumps out of you about this poem? What makes it stand out? I think what's really fascinating is how the poem takes something seemingly simple, like killing a tree. Yeah. And turns it into something much deeper, darker. Okay. Even violent. Okay, I like that. It's not just about chopping down a tree. Yeah. It's like a set of instructions for, for complete eradication. Wow. Like how to totally obliterate a tree, <laughs> yanking out the roots, making sure it's really, truly dead. Jeez, that's intense. But the thing is, mm -hmm. it's described in this very detached, almost scientific tone yeah which when you think about it it's kind of terrifying i know right because it makes you realize how brutal 
our relationship with nature can be. You're right. We often overlook that, don't we? Exactly. So it's like this contrast yeah. between the calm description and the violent act Precisely. that really gives the poem its power. Absolutely. And it also, it also brings up this question of resilience. Okay, how so? Well, think about it. This poem highlights how much effort it actually takes to kill a tree. Oh, you're right. To completely destroy something so deeply rooted. Mm -hmm. It's like the tree itself becomes a symbol. Of the natural world's struggle against uh, oh. against human exploitation. Okay, yeah, yeah, I see that. So we have this, this violence, mm -hmm. but then we also have this incredible resilience. Right. And both are kind of woven together in this poem. Yeah, I'm dying to know how Roots and Branches tackled all this. <laughs> because from what I remember, yeah. They really focused on that destructive impact of humans on nature. You're exactly right. Like that was their main takeaway, right? Yeah. They really hammered home that theme. Okay. And they did this really effectively by highlighting specific lines from the poem. Oh, like which ones? Well, one that really stuck with me was, The root is to be pulled out out of the anchoring earth. It is to be roped, tied, yeah. and pulled out, snapped out. Oof. Yeah, I remember that one. It's brutal. It is now, it's so vivid. You can practically feel the tree being ripped from its home. Right? That's absolutely. It makes you think about mm -hmm. the sheer force yes. we use against the natural world. That's... We don't even think about it. And the imagery. Don't you think the imagery is just... So intense. Yeah. Didn't they also talk about the poem style? Yes. Like how, how does the way it's written contribute to the message? They did. Yeah. They focus on the fact that Patel uses free verse. Free verse. Which gives the poem this really conversational tone, huh. almost like he's just casually chatting with you. Right. But then when you combine that with the graphic imagery, yeah. it creates this really jarring effect. It's like he's describing something horrific, but in this really matter-of-fact way. Exactly. Which makes it even more disturbing. Yeah. It's like he's trying to unsettle us, uh -huh. make us uncomfortable. With our own actions. Exactly. A powerful technique. And they also pointed out that the free verse style makes the poem feel very personal. Oh, yeah. It's like he's speaking directly to the reader. Oh, okay. Which makes it even more difficult to ignore. To ignore his message. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, that makes sense. It's very powerful. Yeah, so he's using the style to really connect with the reader. Absolutely. And make them confront the meaning head on. Yeah, exactly. Like that. So we have the irony, the imagery, the style, mm -hmm. all working together. To deliver this. To deliver this really powerful message. Powerful message, right. And speaking of imagery. Yeah. The hosts also talked about how Patel uses really vivid imagery mm -hmm. to further emphasize the violence of this act. Like, maybe an example. They pointed out words like bleeding bark. Okay, yeah. And source, white and wet. Ooh, yeah, those are evocative. Right. They paint this visceral picture yeah. of the tree's vulnerability, its eventual death. It's amazing how such simple words mm -hmm. can evoke such strong emotions. Right? Absolutely. It's like you can feel the tree's pain almost. It's very powerful. Yeah, yeah. And then they went on to discuss the symbolism of the tree itself. Oh, right. Because trees are, yeah. they're not just, they're not just plants. Exactly. There's all this symbolism behind them. They're often seen as these symbols of life wisdom strength strength yes so by choosing to describe the healing of a tree in such detail patel elevates this act to something much more significant okay so it's not just about this one tree no it's much bigger it's representing something bigger exactly okay so what is it representing well the death of the tree it's like a symbol for the destruction of nature itself Whoa. It's this stark reminder of our impact on the planet. And that brings us to what I find really interesting. What's that? How Roots and Branches connected this poem uh -huh. to modern day issues. Oh, yes, absolutely. Because this poem, I mean, it was written a while ago, right? Decades ago. Decades ago. But they made this really strong point about how it's still so relevant today. It is yeah. because it forces us to confront... Yeah. You know, the ongoing destruction of, of our planet. Of our planet, yeah. And it makes us reevaluate yeah. our relationship with nature. Oh. Like, are we are we just exploiters? Are we stewards? Like, what are we doing? Exactly. Those are the questions we need to be asking ourselves. So it's like this poem is a cautionary tale 
mm -hmm. disguised as a set of instructions. It is. It's both fascinating and unsettling. Yeah, it is. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. And that's what makes it so powerful, I think. Okay, so we've got this poem about killing a tree. Right. Analyzed on another podcast. Yep. And now we're digging even deeper into their analysis. It's meta. It's a deep dive into a deep dive. Exactly. How cool is that? I love it. But there's a lot to unpack here. So oh, yeah. What were some of the key takeaways from this first layer of analysis? Well, what really struck me was... Well, what really struck me was how Patel uses irony to, like, highlight the strength of nature. Okay. He makes it seem like killing a tree is this simple task. Right. But by describing each step so meticulously... Yeah. He's actually showing us how much effort it takes... To kill... To destroy something so deeply rooted. It's like he's saying, oh, yeah... It's so easy to just dominate nature. Exactly. But then he shows us the struggle. Like he's exposing that lie. Absolutely. And that resilience. Yes. The poem keeps coming back to it, doesn't it? It does. Even the imagery of the tree trying to grow no, no, back. Like, right. Like even when it's been chopped down. Even then. Yeah. Remember that line Roots and Branches pointed out? Which one? Miniature boughs. Which, if unchecked, will expand again. Oh, yeah, yeah. You talk about a will to live, right? It's like, even in death, mm -hmm. it's fighting back. It is so powerful. And, you know, what I find really interesting is that Patel achieves all this mm -hmm. with such simple language. Right. There's no, like, grand pronouncements. It's not preachy. Not at all. It's just this clear-eyed observation of a brutal act. Yeah. And that in itself yeah. forces us to confront our role in all this. I see that. It's like he's holding up a mirror. Exactly. And saying, look, look what you're doing. Look at the effort. Look at the effort you put into destroying something so vital. Yeah, that's a pretty sobering thought. It is. No wonder this poem still resonates so much today. It's not just about a tree. It's about... It's about our relationship with the natural world. Okay. Our responsibility towards it and the consequences. Right. The consequences of what we do. And those exam questions. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The roots going. and branches brought up. They were really something, weren't they? They were brilliant, I think, because they force you to think about those consequences. Yeah. It's one thing to just read the poem mm -hmm. and maybe admire it. Sure. But those questions really make you confront those uncomfortable truths. They really challenge us to think critically about the poem. And about how it applies to our own lives. Exactly. You know, I think that's what makes this meta deep dive so interesting. Yeah. It's not just about the poem itself. Mm -hmm. It's about how others have interpreted it. We're getting multiple perspectives. Yeah, like we're having a conversation. Oh, I like that. With all these different experts. Oh, yeah. And by looking at those different views, I think we get a much deeper understanding. Yeah, I agree. Of the poem's complexity. Yes, and the nuances. Yeah, there's so much there. Layers of meaning. Yeah, and some of those layers are pretty disturbing when you think yeah. about the impact we have on the planet. It's a stark picture, isn't it? It is, but mm. Roots and Branches made a really good point. What was that? About how the poem connects to these big issues. Like deforestation and climate change? Yes. They're not just abstract problems. They're the result of actions. Yeah, and they happen over and over and over. Countless acts of destruction. Yeah, just like the one described in the poem. It's a powerful reminder for sure. So where does that leave us? What do we take away from all this, from this deep dive into a deep dive? I think the most important takeaway is, I think the most important takeaway is we need to like really rethink our relationship with nature. Yeah. You know, this poem is brutal honesty, that stark imagery. It yeah. forces us to confront the consequences. Of our actions. Of our actions. It's like a wake-up call. It is. It's easy to forget, you know? It is. In our day-to-day -day lives, we don't always think about yeah. the impact we're having exactly. on the planet. Yeah, we get caught up in our routines. Right. But this poem, it reminds us yeah. Yeah. that even small acts, like even cutting down one tree, right. can have these huge consequences. It is a ripple effect. It is, and then when you think about it, yeah. on a larger scale... You multiply that by millions. Exactly. It's mind-blowing. The impact is staggering. It is, and that brings us back to... What Roots and Branches talked yes. about. Yes. Deforestation, climate change. Exactly. This poem, it's not just some old thing. No. It's reflecting the challenges we're facing right now. It is, and I think that's why it's so important to engage with art that... You know, that challenges us. It makes us uncomfortable. Yeah, it makes us uncomfortable because it helps us see the world. In new ways. In new ways, exactly. And maybe even inspire us to, to make some changes. Positive changes. Yeah, for the better. Absolutely. So it's not just about 
analyzing a poem for the sake of it. No. It's about using that analysis. Yeah. To understand ourselves and, and our place in the world. Exactly. Connecting the dots between. Between art, nature. And our actions. Our actions. Yeah. It all comes together. Well said. All right. So we're wrapping up this, uh, this meta deep dive. Hmm. Deep dive into a deep dive. It's been fun. It has. What's the final mind-blowing thought okay, that you want to leave our listeners with? If killing a single tree, just one tree, mm -hmm. is such a violent act, like Patel describes, right. imagine the impact of deforestation yeah. happening on a massive scale. Globally. Globally, it's almost unfathomable. It's overwhelming, isn't it? It is. But I think there's also a glimmer of hope in this deep dive. Oh, how so? Well, the fact that we're having this conversation... That we're analyzing this poem, it means we're not ignoring the problem. Yeah, that's true. And awareness is the first step. It is. Awareness leads to action. Exactly. So, listener, if you're out there, mm -hmm. take what you've learned from this deep dive. Yeah. Apply it to your own life. Plant a tree. Plant a tree. Reduce your consumption. Mm -hmm. Support organization. Yes. Fighting for environmental justice. Absolutely. Every little bit helps. And until next time, keep questioning. Keep learning. And keep diving. deep see you later folks okay so today we're going deep really deep into just one poem oh yeah just one okay it's called asleep in the valley okay by arthur rimbo arthur rimbo yeah now this guy he was a french poet obviously and get this he started writing super young wow i mean ridiculously young. like how young and then poof he just quit writing poetry entirely by the time he was 19 really just stopped yeah, crazy, right? Yeah, that is wild. It's from this collection of his called Poesies from 1872. Okay. So are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. Let's uncover what's hidden below the surface of this poem. I love that hidden layers beneath the surface. That's such a good way to put it. You know, when I first read Asleep in the Valley, I was really struck by the contrast in it. The contrast? Yeah, like between this beautiful imagery and then, bam, this really shocking image. Oh, yeah, right. I know what you mean. It's really effective, right? It is, yeah. It's like Rimbo sets up this peaceful scene and then just shatters it. Exactly. So powerful. So to really get the full impact, I think we need to hear the poem first. Yeah, let's hear it. I'll read it aloud. Okay. Small green valley where a slow stream flows and leaves long strands of silver on the bright grass from the mountaintop stream. The sun's rays, they fill the hollow full of light. Hmm. A soldier... Very young, lies open-mouthed a pillow made of fern, beneath his head asleep stretched in the heavy undergrowth pale in his warm green sun-soaked bed. Wow. His feet among the flowers he sleeps. His smile is like an infant's gentle without guile. It's so peaceful. Oh, uh, nature, keep him warm. He may catch cold. The humming insects don't disturb his rest. He sleeps in sunlight, one hand on his breast at peace in his side. There are two red holes. Oh, wow. That ending. Yeah, right. It's like a punch to the gut. Totally. You're going along, enjoying this beautiful scenery, and then... You realize he's dead. Yeah. It's chilling. It really is, and so effective. Yeah, and it's not by accident. It's very deliberate. Oh, how so? Well, the poem is what's called an Italian sonnet, which means it has 14 lines split into an octave that's eight lines. Okay. And a sestet, which is six. Got it. And the structure, it's often used to, like set up a problem and then give a solution right or like a shift in perspective exactly and here rimbo he uses it to make you feel peaceful right like you're lulled in exactly and then bam the bam. truth so brutal but so well done and the language in that first part the octave oh it's gorgeous yeah it's like he's painting this perfect picture yeah it's like paradise right the stream the sunlight oh so calm and dreamy and then he describes the soldier oh yeah young yeah and with a smile like an infant's. So innocent. Totally vulnerable. Like he's part of nature at peace with it. And then that one line in the Sesta, it changes everything. Ah, nature, keep him warm, he may catch cold. I know, it's like a mother talking. Yeah, so full of care, and that's when you realize... Yeah, drawn. Yeah. It's heartbreaking. It really is, and it also shows how nature just doesn't care. What do you mean? Well, this young man, he's dead. His life is cut short, and nature just keeps going. <laughs> Right, like nothing happened. Exactly, and it gets even stronger with the humming insects. Oh, yeah, they don't disturb his rest. 
It's like they're oblivious to the tragedy. Just going about their business. Yeah, Rimbo's word choice is really powerful throughout. I was thinking the same thing. Silver, sun-soaked, sleep. So peaceful, romantic. And then two red holes. Ugh, it's so jarring. Yeah, that's the reality of war, breaking through this peaceful scene. It's like those two red holes are a symbol. Oh, I like that. For violence, you know, breaking through that illusion of peace. Yeah, it's like the poem itself has been wounded. Wow. Yeah, and we can't forget the historical context either. Right. Rimbo was writing after the Franco-Prussian War. Oh, right. A time of huge change in France. And a lot of people would experience that war firsthand. So this poem would really hit home for them. Oh, absolutely. It would have been so powerful. And it's still relevant today. Sadly, yes. We're still dealing with war and its consequences. It's tragic. And this poem reminds us that life is fragile. Yeah. And war has a real human cost. It makes you think, doesn't it? About? About how even those peaceful, beautiful places in nature, yeah. they might have their own hidden stories of loss. Like silent witnesses. Yeah, it's like there's always more beneath the surface. Mm, that's something to keep in mind, isn't it? Definitely. It's a good reminder to look deeper. Yeah, always look deeper. Absolutely. Thanks for that. You too. Welcome to uh, this deep dive, and it's into a single poem this time. Oh, wow. Which might sound... You know, a little simple at first, yeah. but trust me, poetry can pack a punch. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Way more than a whole novel sometimes. It really can. Today, we're going to be looking at A Sleep in the Valley okay. by Arthur Rimbaud. I like this one. Um, he was a French poet writing right after the Franco-Prussian War. Ah, uh, right. And that's going to be pretty key to understanding this. Yeah, the context is huge for this one. Yeah. What's fascinating to me is how he uses this, like, peaceful poem yeah. to say something so profound about war. You yeah, know? yeah. It's not like a battle cry or anything. Right. It's like the opposite. Yeah. It's quiet reflection yeah. that sticks with you. So picture this. We open on this beautiful valley. Okay. Sunlight kind of filtering through the trees. I'm with you. Flowers are blooming everywhere. Nice. You can practically hear the insects buzzing. Yeah. And right in the middle of it all, there's this young soldier. Okay. Lying fast asleep. Like he's taking a nap. Totally peaceful. Okay, I like it. But the thing is, yeah. Rimbaud doesn't just like dump this whole image on us at once. Right. He slowly reveals the detail. Okay. Like the soldier's posture, you know, mm. totally relaxed, mouth is slightly open. Mm hmm. And it almost feels like nature itself is cradling him. Oh, wow. And it creates this feeling of total peace. Yeah. Like a lullaby almost. It's really inviting you into this serene space. Totally. Yeah. It's like nature's tucking him in, wow. keeping him safe. I love that. And he even mentions the soldier's smile. Correct. Comparing it to like a baby smile. Oh, wow. So innocent. Yeah. No trace of worry at all. Like completely unguarded. Yeah. That's just brilliant the way he does that. You mm. know, he sets up this image of total peace and innocence. Right. And then the last line. Yeah. It hits you like a punch in the gut. Uh, just like that. Rimbo just states, in his side, there are two red holes. Whoa. Yeah. And everything changes. Yeah. Everything shifts. It's like that moment in a movie. Oh, yeah. Where you realize the person you thought was sleeping mm -hmm. is actually like not sleeping yeah <laughs> yeah mm. this peaceful valley suddenly turns into a battlefield graveyard <laughs> right instantaneously yeah talk about a twist oh man right that's where the sonnet form comes into play okay that rimbo chose you know okay so the poem's structure like yeah. how it's divided into the octave and sestet mm -hmm. that actually mirrors this shift in emotion it does it so well so wait it's not just some like stuffy technical thing no not at all the form is actually part of the meaning exactly whoa okay the octave those first eight lines they lull you into that sense of peace mm -hmm. with that beautiful valley description yeah and then the sestet the last six lines yeah it starts to subtly shift okay focuses more on the soldier himself Right. A vulnerability, and then bam, yeah. that last line. The reveal. It's like the poem tricks you into feeling safe. Totally. And then yanks the rug out from under you. Yep. What about the rhyming? Oh, yeah, good point. That's pretty structured, too, right? It is very structured. And does that fit into all this? So it follows the traditional Italian okay. or Petrarchan sonnet rhyme scheme, mm -hmm. you know, ABA, ABB, and so on. Right. 
And that strict pattern creates this musicality. Yeah. Almost like you said, that lullaby feeling. Right. Which makes the break at the end yeah. even more jarring. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so he's using the form and the rhyme mm -hmm. to heighten the impact. Exactly. So That's pretty clever. He was a master of this. And then there's the imagery itself. Oh, yeah. He doesn't just say like, oh, the valley's beautiful. Yeah. He paints us this picture. Yes. With words like silver sunlight. Yeah bright grass uh -huh. the hum of the insects it's so vivid it's so alive yeah which yeah. makes the contrast with the soldier's death right even more heartbreaking it's so poignant and the way he describes him with yeah. his feet among the flowers yeah head resting on ferns yeah it's like nature is unaware of what's happened right trying to comfort him yeah even though he's beyond comfort it's heartbreaking yeah and that really drives home the tragedy, you know, wow. nature, this force of life and growth. Yeah. Powerless against this violence. You mentioned earlier that there's a strong anti-war message. Oh, yeah. But he never actually says, like, war is bad. He doesn't have to. Right. That's what's so brilliant. Yeah. He doesn't need to spell it out. Right. By focusing on the aftermath. Right. The death of this young soldier. Yeah. In the middle of this beauty. Yeah. The message is crystal clear. War is senseless. Senseless. So instead of glorifying battles or heroes, right. he's showing us the cost. The human cost. The waste. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And by putting this tragic scene yeah. in such a beautiful setting, mm -hmm. he highlights the contrast right. between what life should be. What it could be peaceful yeah full of potential yes and the destruction that war brings exactly it's yeah. like a silent accusation yeah especially knowing that Rimbol saw this firsthand right after a war that devastated his country it adds so much weight to it if we zoom out a little though oh, yeah. i think the poem goes beyond that specific historical context right it taps into something universal the human experience so loss loss longing for peace it's something we all share yeah and what i find really interesting yeah is that he doesn't dwell on the battle itself yeah he focuses on what comes after the aftermath the quiet tragedy left behind it's a powerful choice it is it lets the reader kind of fill in the blanks themselves imagine those horrors without him having to describe them and it's so effective in evoking that emotional response it really is. We're not being told how to feel. Right. We're experiencing it. Through the imagery. Through the language. Of powerful stuff. It's like we're standing right there in the valley ourselves. You're right there with the soldier. You feel the weight of his death. It's heavy. Even though we never knew him. It's incredible how he does that. The poem doesn't tell you what to think. No, it doesn't. It shows you. It makes you confront it head on. The reality of war and its impact, yeah. it really gets under your skin. It does. It's beautiful yeah. and heartbreaking. At the same time. It's the kind of thing you don't forget. It stays with you. That's the power of poetry. I think so. Distilling these complex emotions. Huge truths. Into just a few words. And the impact lasts. We've talked a lot about the message mm -hmm. and the form, mm -hmm. but I want to know more about nature's role in all this. Oh, yeah. That's important. It's more than just a pretty background, right? Much more. It's almost like a character. You could say that. It's multifaceted. Definitely. On one hand, yeah. it's a witness. Silently observing. Like the trees and the flowers are standing guard. Very witness. To this tragedy. Yes. But it also takes on this role of caretaker. It tries to comfort. Even in death. Yeah. The image of him lying among the flowers, uh, pillow made of fern. So tender. Suggests this tenderness. Even though it's futile. Right. And that's what makes it so tragic. Yeah. Nature with all its power. Yeah. Can't protect him from this. This act of human violence. Yeah. There's a deep irony in that. Definitely. Nature doesn't know he's dead. It doesn't. It keeps nurturing him. Yeah. Oblivious. To the permanence of the sleep. The sun still shines. Flowers still bloom. Insects buzz. This jarring contrast. Between life going on. Is stillness. Is powerful. It's like nature itself is in denial. You could say that. Refusing to acknowledge this horrible thing. That's interesting. And that denial mm -hmm. adds to the anti-war message, I think. I'll say it's like well. war is so unnatural, right. so abhorrent, right. that even nature can't comprehend it. 
I like that. It's like he's using nature yeah. to highlight how absurd war is. Okay. How it disrupts this natural order. Right. And leaves destruction in its way. Nature, in its innocence. Right. Indifferent to human conflict. Becomes this powerful circle so that war shatters. Wow. It's amazing how he packs so much meaning. I know. Into these descriptions of nature. He elevates the everyday. The things we take for granted. Into these profound truths. About what it means to be human. It's beautiful. It makes you think. It does. Challenges our complacency, mm. our tendency to just accept war. As this necessary evil. It's not. No, it's not. This raises an important question, though. Okay, I'm listening. Why should we care about this poem yeah. written over a century ago I'm about sorry. a war that's long over? What does it have to do with us today? That's a great question. It is a question we have to grapple with. For me, the power lies in its ability to transcend. Time and place. Yeah. It's rooted in that specific historical moment. Right. But those themes... Of loss. Innocence. The senselessness of war. Those resonate with us. Even now. I it's, it's a reminder yeah. that war, no matter when it happens, mm. no matter why it happens, yeah. always comes at a price. A huge price. Destroys lives. Tears families apart. Leaves scars. On individuals. On the world. And that message is just as urgent today as it was in rimbo's time as long as there's conflict and violence <laughs> this poem is going to keep holding up a mirror <laughs> to humanity forcing us to face the consequence of our actions it's a testament to how art can speak truth to power challenge our perceptions of the world it can change us before we wrap up this first part of our deep dive okay i want to touch on the critical reception sure how has asleep in the valley been interpreted over the years well, it's been hailed as one of his most powerful, okay. enduring works. Makes sense. You know, critics, they praise the imagery, yeah. the anti-war message, mm -hmm. its ability to evoke such a range of emotions. It's fascinating. It is. How a poem that seems so simple on the surface can be so complex. That's Rimbaud for you. He distilled these complex themes, yeah. emotions, mm -hmm. into this concise, impactful form and it's left a mark on generations of readers. It reminds us that great art yeah. often speaks to those universal experiences. Regardless of time or culture. It's timeless. It is. The Sleep in the Valley is a perfect example of that. I, those I mean, themes of loss. Innocence. Futility of war. Just as relevant today. It's a poem that stays with you. Long after you've finished reading. That's the mark of truly great art. It is. Its ability to spark conversation. Silent assumptions. Leave a lasting impact. Beautiful. I think we've covered a lot of ground. We have. In this first part of our dive into Asleep in the Valley. We've explored the structure. Yeah. Imagery. The anti-war message. Critical reception. There's still so much more to uncover. Oh yeah. We're just getting started. In part two, we'll delve even deeper. Into the symbolism. The layers of meaning. Hidden within the language. We'll also look at how it fits into Rimbaud's life. His work as a whole. And we'll explore how it continues to resonate with us today. Offering insights. Into the human struggle. With violence. The need for peace. So important. So stay tuned. For part two. Of our deep dive. Into Asleep in the Valley. We'll be right back. Welcome back to our deep dive into Asleep in the Valley. Glad to be back. We talked about the poem's structure yeah. and how it sets us up for that shocking twist. Right. But now I'm really curious about the symbolism. Oh, yeah. Rimbaud packs so much into these simple descriptions. Uh -huh. There's got to be more to it than meets the eye. There's always more with Rimbo. So it's not just about a soldier lying dead in a field. Right. What's the valley itself symbolizing? Okay, so think about it. Okay. The valley represents more than just the physical location. Okay. It's an image of pure innocence. Okay. Tranquility. Okay. The natural world untouched by human conflict. It's like paradise. Exactly. Garden of Eden. Before anything bad has happened. And then he places this brutal death. Right in the middle. It makes the contrast even more jarring. It does. The tragedy even more profound. It's like he's saying war disrupts that natural order. Right. Bringing violence and death. Into this place that should be peaceful. Full of life. And the flowers. Yes, the flowers. They play a significant role, too. They're not just there for decoration. Right. They symbolize life. Oh, okay. Beauty. Yeah. The fleeting nature of youth. Especially since they're blooming right next to his body. It's powerful imagery. This stark reminder that life goes on. Yes but also that beauty is fragile. 
easily destroyed. Exactly. And then there's the sunlight, okay. which he describes as silver. Mm -hmm. It's not just literal sunlight, right? right? It represents something more. Hope, maybe. Purity. Even a divine presence. Watching over the scene. So even in the midst of this tragedy, yeah, there's a glimmer of hope. Maybe a suggestion that even in the darkest times, there's still light. It's that juxtaposition of hope and the reality of death. That makes it so powerful. Yeah. It creates this tension, right? this unanswered question about life and death. War and peace. It's complex. Like the poem is saying that even with this violence, there's something bigger than us. Something beyond our capacity for destruction. Now let's talk about the soldier himself. Okay. His youth. Yeah. Innocence. The way he seems to be sleeping. Peacefully. Feeds into the message. Definitely. He's almost like the sacrificial lamb. Oh, I like that. A symbol of all the young lives lost. The senselessness of war. His gentle, without guile, smile. Emphasizes his innocence. Yeah. Makes his death even more tragic. It's like he was robbed of a future. A future full of promise. And the way he's described his feet among the flowers. Almost like he's become one with nature. Returning to the earth. That's a great observation. There's this sense of a cycle. Life and death intertwined. Nature being the ultimate receiver. Of all that lives. What about those two red holes? Oh, those are important. They're symbolic, right? Very much so. What do they represent? Think of them as a reminder. Okay. Of the violence that has shattered the peace. Okay. The intrusion of war into this place of innocence. Okay. The brutal reality beneath the beauty and like an exclamation point yes shattering the illusion of peace revealing the true cost of war they symbolize the wounds not just on his body we know but on humanity itself war leaves scars the most that run deep impact generations it's amazing how those two little details they carry so much weight they draw our attention from violence make us confront the consequences they serve as a reminder that even in a place as tranquil as this valley, violence can erupt. Shattering lives. Leaving destruction. So we've talked about the valley. The flowers. The sunlight. The soldier. What other symbols are at play? Well, there's also the way the poem is framed. Okay. As a kind of observation. Yeah. We, the readers, are outsiders looking in. Like we're witnesses. But also, perhaps, complicit. We're implicated. Even if it's just through observing. Rimbo doesn't let us off the hook. No, he doesn't. He makes us confront the reality. And question our own roles. In perpetuating violence. Through our action. Or our inaction. That's a powerful challenge. Especially relevant today. Surrounded by war and violence. What are we doing to promote peace? Are we complicit? In the cycles of violence? Tough questions. Quite essential. And Rimbo makes us grapple with them. Through his poetry. Don't turn away from the truth. Art can be such a powerful tool. For social commentary. Poems written over a century ago can still speak to us. Before we move on okay. to the final part of our deep dive, where we'll explore the historical context, the poem's relevance today. I want to appreciate the beauty of his language. Oh, yes. Even though it's short. Every word is carefully chosen. The imagery is so vivid. Evocative. Even in translation. The shines through. The way he describes the valley. Just sunlight. The flowers. You feel like you're right there. Speaks to the skill of the translator. Capturing the essence. Making it accessible. Great art transcends language barriers. I think we've laid a solid foundation. We've uncovered the layers. Of symbolism and meaning. Now we can dive even deeper. Into the historical context. And its message for us today. Welcome back to the final part of our deep dive into Asleep in the Valley. It's been quite a journey. We've uncovered so much about the poem's structure. Yeah, the imagery. The symbolism. Those layers of meaning. Now I'm ready to zoom out a little. Okay. Consider the historical context. The backdrop. It was written right after the Franco-Prussian War. Right, a conflict that really impacted France. Play. Yeah, to fully grasp the poem. Mm -hmm. You need to understand that historical backdrop. So the Franco-Prussian War. A devastating defeat for France. Oh, okay. Territorial losses. Right. Political upheaval. Wow. A sense of national trauma. So how does that shape our understanding of the poem? It adds another layer. Is it more than just one soldier's story? Absolutely. What's it saying about the war then? Well, the poem is steeped in disillusionment. Okay. France had entered the war expecting victory. Right. But the reality was brutal. Yeah. The conflict exposed War's brutality, mm -hmm. futility, right. shattering any romantic notions of glory. 
So the soldier in the valley becomes a symbol. For all the lives lost. A representation of the cost. The immense cost of the conflict. And it wasn't just the physical cost, right? No, the emotional and psychological toll. On the nation. The despair and hopelessness. That permeated French society. It's palpable in the poem. Amplified by the contract. Between the idyllic valley. And his death. Rimbaud's saying, even in the most peaceful setting. War can intrude. Shattering lives. Leaving destruction. It's a powerful message. So how did people react to the poem when it was first published? You know, while Rimbo wasn't widely known during his lifetime, right. Asleep in the Valley did garner some attention. People recognized it. That poignant depiction of war's human cost. But given the political climate at the time? Oh, yeah. I imagine it stirred some controversy. You're right. The poem's anti-war sentiment yeah. likely made some people uncomfortable. Especially those clinging to ideas of military glory. National pride. Sounds like Rimbaud was ahead of his time. I think so. Challenging conventional thinking. In a subtle but powerful way. And that's what makes it so relevant today, right? Absolutely. The war and violence are still so prevalent. Asleep in the Valley is a reminder. Of the human cost. The poem transcends its historical context. Speaking to that universal experience. Of loss. Grief. The futility of war. It's like we haven't learned from the past. It's a sad truth. Even in the 21st century. We repeat the same mistakes. That's perhaps the most tragic aspect. That human nature is capable of such extremes. Great love and unimaginable cruelty. It's a paradox. But there's also hope in the poem. That flicker. Something transcendent. Suggesting that even in darkness... Beauty and life persist. You're right. The poem doesn't offer easy answers. But it makes us think. About the complexities of war. And peace. The choices we make. As individuals. As a society. It's a call to action. A reminder to strive for a better world. Where peace is more than just a dream. A beautiful sentiment. So after this deep dive. What can we take away from Asleep in the Valley? For me, it's a reminder. That even amidst tragedy. There's beauty to be found in the world. And that art can be a powerful tool. For social commentary. For it's a testament to the power of poetry. To connect us across time and space. To share in the experiences of others. A beautiful way to put it. Thank you for joining us on this deep dive into Asleep in the Valley. It's been a pleasure exploring this poem with you. Until. All right, so get ready because today we are going deep, deep into the idea of literary immortality. Ooh. Sounds intense. It is. You know how there are just some works of art that just seem to echo, like, through time? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, we are going to be tackling one of those today. Oh, cool. Shakespeare's Sonnet 18. One of the greats. One of the greats. And we are going to be looking at the one that starts, Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day? Oh, yeah. Okay. Classic. Classic. All right. So... Setting the scene for us. Yes. Yeah, so just really quickly, a sonnet is like this little 14-line pressure cooker of poetry right yeah they have all these rules you know <laughs> like iambic pentameter and the rhyme scheme oh yeah there are so many rules but shakespeare he was the absolute king of just packing meaning into those lines yeah he was a master total master i feel like we should almost have like a dramatic echo after that master <laughs> <laughs> but okay so shakespeare sonnets we get it yeah but why does this one poem in particular sonnet 18 still make us feel things centuries after it was written well i think part of it is that it's basically a love letter, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But it's a love letter with an agenda. Ooh, tell me more. So Shakespeare isn't just complimenting his friend on their, you know, good looks. Oh, so there's more to it. Yeah, there's so much more to it. Yeah. He's actually using this poem to fight against time. Literally. Whoa, I never thought of it that way. It's true. Like, hey, time, you may try to fade everything, but not this beauty. Not on my watch. Exactly. And that's where the whole comparing to a summer's day thing comes in. Okay, yeah, let's talk about that. He starts off all romantic, but then he's like, hold on a second. Summer's kind of a mess sometimes, isn't it? Right. It's too hot or too windy or everything is wilting. Exactly. He's not exactly holding back on summer's flaws. So what's the point of that? Is he just trying to make his friend feel better by... You know, dissing Summer? Well, I think he's setting up this really clever contrast, right? Oh, okay. Summer's beauty is fleeting. It's inconsistent. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But the beauty that he sees in his friend, that's a completely different thing. Oh, I see. It's a whole other ball game. I like that. A whole other ball game. Right. And you know what else? The sonnet itself, the poem itself, becomes like this key to locking that beauty in. 
What do you mean? It's like preserving it in amber. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it is, right? So he's basically saying, as long as people are reading these words, your beauty can't be touched by time. Whoa, that is powerful. It really is, right? Right. And he drives that point home with the sonnet's structure, the way he builds the argument. Okay, so I am loving all of this, all these metaphors and the time-bending thing. But huh. before we get too lost in it all, can we break it down for our listeners who maybe aren't as familiar with Sonnet 18? Like, what are the key moments that really show this fight against time that you were talking about? Okay, yeah, that's a great point. Back it up a bit. Let's back it up. Well, th Ooh. there's that line, but thy eternal summer shall not fade. Right, right. He's taking something fleeting, like a season, and mm -hmm. making it into something permanent, unchanging, eternal. Ooh, eternal. And that permanence, it comes from the poem itself. Oh. He He's basically saying, I, William Shakespeare, am making you immortal. Hold on. Is he taking all the credit here? Like, it's the poem that's making the person immortal, not, you know, the person's actual qualities. Hmm. That's a good question. I think it's something worth exploring, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's a really insightful question, actually. And it, it kind of gets to the heart of what makes this sonnet so fascinating. Right. I, I think it's a bit of both, honestly. Okay. Shakespeare is definitely acknowledging that his friend has this unique beauty. Yeah. But he's also saying that his poetry, his art, has the power to amplify it. To immortalize it. So it's like a collaboration almost. Yes, I like that. It's like the friend provides the inspiration, the raw material, and then Shakespeare shapes it into this lasting work of art. Right, exactly. And that brings us back to the sonnet structure discussion. Okay, so you were saying earlier that Shakespeare is carefully building an argument. Yes. He's not just randomly praising his friend. No, not at all. Each quatrain, which is like a four-line section of the sonnet, it adds a new layer to his argument. Okay, so remind me, how many quatrains are in a sonnet? Three. Okay, three. Like a three-story building. Okay, got it. So the first quatrain, it sets up the comparison where to Summer's Day. Yeah. The second one points out all of Summer's flaws. Yeah. And then the third one, that's where he introduces this whole eternal summer concept. Oh, very sneaky. It is, right. <laughs> and then, bam, huh. the final couplet. That's the two lines at the end. Yeah. It hits us with the grand finale. It's like he's setting the scene. He's drawing us in with the summer comparison. And then, bam, he drops the immortality bomb in the last two lines. Exactly. Very dramatic. Oh, he was all about the drama. Shakespeare loved drama. He did. So we're talking about some of the most famous lines in English literature, right? So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee pretty iconic I, got I mean he's basically saying as long as humans exist as long as we can appreciate art your beauty will live on wow he's linking the poem's survival to his friend's immortality so it's not just about the poem itself it's about what the poem represents it's right? exactly it's about this idea that art can transcend time it can defeat death that's pretty deep. It is, right. So it's not just about pretty words. It's about this deeper meaning. And the way he uses specific language and literary devices to convey that meaning. Okay, I am ready to geek out a little bit. Like, what are some of your favorite literary techniques that Shakespeare uses in this sonnet? All right, let's geek out. Well, we already talked about the extended metaphor of summer. Yeah. But the way he personifies summer is also just... Ah, brilliant. Oh, right. Giving these human-like qualities to these forces of nature. Okay. Like rough winds, the sun's gold complexion. Yeah. It makes them almost like characters in the poem. Ooh, that's cool. It's like he's turning Summer into this dramatic figure who is trying to, like, steal the spotlight but ultimately fails. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And then, you know, it makes the friend's beauty seem even more powerful in comparison. Absolutely. Yeah. And it emphasizes that contrast between the unpredictable fleeting nature of the natural world yeah and the lasting perfect beauty he sees in his friend okay yeah i can see that right yeah what else there's also something really clever about how he uses the future tense mm -hmm. in those final lines okay remember so long lives this oh yeah he's not just saying the poem exists he's saying it actively lives right it breathes it continues to have an impact on people and by extension, the person he's addressing also continues to live through the poem. Yes, ah. precisely. It's this beautiful cycle of creation and preservation. It's like he tapped into some kind of like eternal energy source and plugged his friend into it. I love that. 
So I think our listeners are getting a real sense of how Shakespeare uses all of these different techniques yeah. to create something that goes beyond just a nice poem. It's so true. It's a statement about the power of art itself. Absolutely. And I think it's also important to remember the historical context here. Okay, let's talk history. So Shakespeare was writing during the Elizabethan era, right? Mm -hmm. This was a time of just incredible intellectual and artistic flourishing. Yeah, like the Renaissance and everything. Exactly. And sonnets, they were super popular back then. Really? They were like the pop songs of the day. Oh, wow. Everyone from courtiers to commoners, they were reading and writing sonnets. So he was tapping into this really popular form. He was, but he was also elevating it to a whole new level. Okay, I see. So he took this familiar structure yeah. and used it to explore these really profound ideas about beauty, time, and the power of art. Exactly. And that's part of what makes Sonnet 18 so enduring, you know? Mm. It speaks to us across centuries because it taps into these universal human experiences. Yeah, like we all want to feel beautiful, we all want to feel loved, Yeah, and we all fear, you know, fading away, time passing us by. And I think we all have this desire to leave something lasting behind in the world. And Shakespeare's saying, hey, art can do that for you. Wow. It's like this powerful tool that we can use to fight against oblivion. I like that. I like that a lot. It's powerful stuff. Okay. So before we move on, any other thoughts about Sonnet 18? I think it's just incredible how a poem written over 400 years ago can still resonate so deeply with us today. What do you think it is about this sonnet that makes it so timeless? I think it's the themes, you know? Like the yearning for beauty, the fear of fading away, the hope for some kind of immortality. Yeah. Those are things that are just as relevant today as they were in Shakespeare's time. Yeah. When uh -huh. he manages to convey all of that in such a concise, beautiful way. Right. And there's also this sense of hope, right? Like mm -hmm. he's not just like lamenting the passage of time. Yeah. Good he's chance. offering a solution through the power of art. Absolutely. Sonnet 18 is ultimately a testament to the enduring power of creativity, I think. Shakespeare is saying that even though our physical bodies may fade, the beauty we create, the emotions we express through art can live on forever. Ooh. It's pretty powerful stuff. It is. It's like he built this monument to beauty, not with stone or marble, but with words. Yeah, I love that. And it's a monument that anyone can access just by reading the poem. That's a really good point, I think, to highlight for our listeners. Yeah. You know, we've been unpacking all these layers of meaning, mm -hmm. but at its core, Sonnet 18 is a poem about the power of art to transcend time yes. and touch people's lives. It reminds us that we all have that power within us. You know, mm -hmm. we can create things that will outlive us. What do you mean? Whether it's a poem, a song, a painting, a story, or even just a simple act of kindness. Oh, I see. Okay. Those things can have a ripple effect that extends far beyond our own lifetimes. That's beautiful. It is, right. Okay, well, as we start to wrap up our deep dive into Sonnet 18, okay. I want to leave our listeners with a challenge. Oh, a challenge. Okay, Bobby. I like this. Inspired by Shakespeare's masterpiece. Right, hear me with it. If you could have one aspect of your life captured in a work of art, okay, what would it be? Mm. And what form would that art take? Would it be a photograph, a song, a painting, a sculpture, a dance? Ooh, that's a tough one. What would you choose to make eternal? Wow, that's a beautiful question to ponder. It really gets to the heart of what matters most to us, right? It does, it does. What do we want to leave behind in the world? What stories do we want to tell? Exactly. I think I need some time to think about that one. Yeah, me too. It's a really good question to think about. It is. So to our listeners, go out there and create something beautiful, something meaningful, something that will make a mark on the world. Yes. Who knows? Maybe centuries from now, people will be studying your work and marveling at its enduring power. And they might even dedicate a whole podcast episode to it. Huh. Well, that's a goal worth striving for. Careful. Until next time, keep exploring, keep creating, and keep those imaginations firing. And remember, like Shakespeare showed us, even a summer's day can become eternal if we capture it just right. Beautifully said. Yeah, it's wild, isn't it? It really makes you think about what makes a piece of art timeless, you know? What gives it that staying power? You know what I think is really interesting about this sonnet? Mm -hmm. It's that balance between acknowledging that time passes and things fade. Yeah. But also that there is this potential for a kind of immortality through art. Exactly. It's like he's recognizing the problem, but also offering a solution at the same time. 
I like that. So it's not just like a sad poem about loss. It's like, hey, we can fight back against this with beauty. Exactly. And that's where I think the real power of this sonnet lies. So what do you think, like, why has this specific poem, Sonnet 18, resonated with people for so long? Like, what is it about this particular sonnet? Mm, that's a good question. It's not just the themes. It's not just the themes, no. Like, I think it's also the way that Shakespeare uses language. Absolutely. Like, he's so good with like, imagery. Yeah. And those metaphors, like, they just stick with you. They're so vivid, you know? Yeah. It's like you can practically picture. Yeah. Like, the rough winds shaking those darling buds of May. Totally. And I also think it's the structure of the sonnet, too, right? Like, the way it builds to that powerful final couplet. Oh, yeah. That structure is key. Like, each quashrain mm. adds another layer of meaning, and then bam! You get hit with those final two lines and it just like seals the deal. It really does. It's like this perfect little package of meaning. Yeah, it's so well crafted. I think that's part of it too. It is. It's like, you know, it's a sonnet. It follows all the rules, but it also feels so fresh and alive even after centuries. Yeah. It's crazy to think that people were reading this poem like hundreds of years ago and feeling something. <laughs> I know, right? It's the same things that we're feeling today. It's like this little time machine. It is. That connects us to like the past the present and the future exactly and that's why we still study it we still talk about it, we still find meaning in it even in the 21st century you know it's pretty amazing it is all right so as we wrap up our deep dive into sonnet 18 yeah i want to leave our listeners with maybe just one final thought to chew on okay fire away we've talked a lot about shakespeare you know his skill as a poet mm -hmm. but i think there's a bigger takeaway here right like it's about the potential for any of us to create something that lasts. Oh, I like that. It doesn't have to be a sonnet. Right. It can be a song, a painting, a story, a dance, a photograph, anything really that expresses something meaningful. Yeah, as long as it comes from the heart, right? Exactly. Okay. So I want to encourage our listeners to go out there and create something beautiful, something meaningful, something that will make a mark on the world. And who knows, maybe centuries from now people yeah. will be listening to a podcast about your work right analyzing its every word trying to unlock its secrets now that is a legacy worth striving for i think i think so too so until next time keep exploring keep creating and keep those imaginations firing and never underestimate the power of a well-crafted sonnet and welcome well back for another deep dive mm -hmm. today we're going to be um looking at nature through the lens of poetry how cool and we'll be exploring this really uh, a beautiful and thought-provoking sonnet by John Keats. Oh, Keats, yeah. Called the Poetry of Earth. Right. <laughs> now, you might already know Keats as a key figure in the English Romantic movement. Absolutely. He was known for his vivid imagery and uh, really sensory language. Yeah, his ability to just transport you with his words is incredible. Yeah, it's like you could almost smell the flowers and hear the birds singing just by reading his poems. Right. And in the Poetry of Earth... Keats introduces this really fascinating idea Okay. that nature's music never really stops. Hmm. It just sort of changes and transforms with the seasons. Okay. And he uses these two tiny creatures, the grasshopper and the cricket. Oh, interesting. As sort of representatives of this ongoing natural symphony. Oh, I like that. Yeah, it's like they're taking turns on this grand natural stage. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Each with their own unique song to contribute to this bigger picture. Right, and they each represent different seasons too, right? Exactly. So the grasshopper, he, you know, he's basking in the summer luxury. Right, full of energy. Yeah, embodying all that vibrancy and warmth. And then you have the cricket, right, who sings his song amidst the frost, wrought a silence of winter, yes, representing a totally different kind of beauty, you know. Yeah, more resilience and endurance. Exactly. And the way Keats structures the poem actually mirrors this whole cyclical theme, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. Like the poem itself sort of echoes the changing seasons. You're right. Yeah, so <laughs> he uses the Petrarchan sonnet form, right, which is divided into two parts. Yeah. The octave, the first eight lines, mm -hmm. and the cest at the last six lines. Okay. And he uses the octave to really paint a picture of the grasshopper's world. The summer world. Right, all that life and movement and energy. Right. And then as the poem shifts to the cestet. Yeah. We move into the cricket's domain. The quieter winter world. Exactly where things are more, still more introspective. Right. It's like the poem itself is breathing in and out with the seasons. Yes. And the sonic landscapes that he creates are <sighs> just incredible. Oh, they really are. So in the octave, 
Even when the birds are like exhausted from the heat. Hiding in the cooler shade. Yeah, we hear this other voice yeah. that runs from hedge to hedge. The grasshopper. The grasshopper. Full of that summer luxury. Right. And then in the sense that the whole scene changes, right? Yes. Like a completely different world. We're in this frosty, almost like sacredly silent world. But there's still music there. Yeah. If you listen closely. The cricket song. And it's not just the imagery that creates this musicality. Right. It's the rhythm and the rhyme scheme of the sonnet, too. It's like he composed it like a piece of music. Yes. So he uses this consistent rhythm called iambic pentameter. Oh, yeah. The da do um da do Yeah, it gives the whole poem this steady heartbeat. Like the pulse. And then the rhyme scheme, A-B-B-A, A-B-A, C-D-C-D-C-D, creates these echoing sounds that just reinforce this idea of like an ongoing flow. Yeah, it's amazing how he uses all these techniques to make you feel that continuous song. And even as the seasons are changing. Right, even as the landscape transforms. Well, you know, something else that I find really interesting is how Keats doesn't just, like, describe these creatures. Yeah. He gives them personalities. Yeah. Like, he's imagining them as little performers on this grand stage. Let me see what you mean. Yeah, each one taking their turn to carry on nature's melody. Mm-hmm. What do you think he's doing with that? Oh, I'm not sure, but it makes me wonder if he saw them as more than just insects. Right, like they represent something bigger. Exactly, and I think that's a great place to pick up in our next part. Yeah, I'd love to dig into that more. So join us next time as we continue to explore the deeper meaning behind Keats' The Poetry of Earth. Sounds good. Yeah. So, you know, I think those personalities that Keats gives to the creatures, right. it really points to some of those deeper layers of meaning in this poem. You know... He's not just, like I said earlier, fixated on just the sounds they make. Mm -hmm. I think he's using the grasshopper and the cricket yeah. as metaphors to explore these bigger ideas. Like what kind of ideas? Oh, about the enduring power of nature okay. and um, art and I think even life itself. So he's suggesting that there's this underlying like energy or something yeah. that keeps going even when things on the surface seem quiet or dormant. Exactly. Like with that cricket finding a way to keep singing even in the winter. Right. It's not just about surviving. You know, mm -hmm. it's about thriving, yep. creating beauty and expressing yourself even when things are tough. And that image of the cricket singing in warmth increasing ever, mm -hmm. even though everything is silent and frosty around him. Yeah. It's just such a powerful image of resilience. It really is. And it makes me think about how life just finds a way, mm. you know, Yeah. even in those unexpected places. It does. And I think that that's a really comforting thought, yeah. you know, especially when we're going through tough times ourselves. Yeah. Knowing that there's this like cycle of life and renewal oh, that just keeps going no matter what. It reminds us that we're all part of something much bigger than ourselves. Yeah. Something that has endured for like millennia. Right. And that we can find that same strength yes. to get through our own challenges. It's just like nature does. What I love about this poem is how Keats takes something seemingly so simple. Right. You know, just observing the sounds of nature. Mm -hmm. And he turns it into this like profound meditation on the continuity of life. Yeah. He's really good at that. It's really amazing. It is. It makes me think about, you know, where I see those examples of the poetry of earth in my own life. Oh, yeah. That's a good question. Like where I see those moments of beauty and resilience. You know, it really is all around us. If yeah. we just sort of open our eyes and our ears, mm. like um, the way a flower pushes through a crack in the pavement. Right. Or the rhythm of the waves crashing on the shore. Those little everyday things. Exactly. All those things are expressions of that same enduring song that Keats is talking about. And it's so easy to miss those things. Yeah, if we're not paying attention. If we're just rushing through life. Right. But Keats is kind of encouraging us to slow down. Yeah, to really be present. And to appreciate those little moments. And to notice that resilience, you know, like yeah. that tree that's adapted to grow around an obstacle right. or those wildflowers pushing through the cracks in the sidewalk. It could even be like the wind chimes, you know, yeah. on a breezy day. Exactly. It's all about tuning into that poetry of earth yeah and recognizing that that creative spirit is all around us i think that what makes this poem so timeless mm -hmm. is that it speaks to like this universal human experience yeah i think you're right you know we all face challenges in life absolutely we all go through seasons of change we do but there's something so comforting in knowing yeah that this Poetry of Earth continues no matter what. It's a constant. It is a constant. Even amidst all the chaos. 
And I think that's a really powerful message. Yeah, it is. And what's also interesting is how Keats subtly connects the endurance of nature right. to the enduring power of art. Oh, how so? Well, just as nature's song continues through the changing seasons, mm -hmm. so part two yeah. does poetry. Yeah. Like it transcends time and place. And it connects with people across generations. Yeah. I yeah. love that connection. Yeah. So it's not just about nature's resilience, but also the power of art. Mm-hmm. To capture that resilience. To preserve those qualities. And to remind us of those deeper truths. Even as the world around us changes. Exactly. I that. love that. So the poetry of Earth, it's yeah. not just a description of nature. It's ah. a celebration of that creative spirit. Yeah. Both in the natural world and in us. That's beautiful. You know, it really makes you stop and think. It does. Keats is reminding us that yeah. there's this constant like underlying music. Mm-hmm like a life force yeah. that's always there if we just take the time to listen for it absolutely where do you find those examples oh gosh of the poetry of earth yeah. in your own life you know i think it can be as simple as like a beautiful sunset yeah. or even just the sound of rain on the leaves right or the way a spider web sparkles with dew in the morning oh yeah those little everyday things it's so easy to overlook those it is if you're not paying attention yeah but keats is saying like slow down yeah be present appreciate it exactly and it doesn't have to be something big and dramatic no not at all it could be like you said those everyday wonders mm -hmm. like a tree that's had to grow around something in its way right or those wildflowers in the sidewalk cracks yeah it just shows you how resilient nature is exactly so it's all about yeah tuning our senses to the poetry of earth mm -hmm. recognizing that that creative spirit is all around us it really is well i think that's a perfect place to wrap things up it is key to the poetry of earth it's just this beautiful reminder mm -hmm. that no matter what challenges we face right. no matter what changes are happening yeah there's this enduring song mm -hmm. a life force that just keeps going it persists and by opening ourselves up to that poetry of earth yeah i think we can tap into that same resilience absolutely find beauty and meaning even when times are tough i agree so thank you so much for joining us on this deep dive yeah thanks for listening into the poetry of Earth. It's been a pleasure. And we hope you enjoyed exploring this really timeless poem with us. Yeah, me too. And until next time. Yes. Keep exploring. Keep listening. Keep listening for that enduring song of nature. Yes, and keep diving deep. We'll see you next time. <laughs> right, ready to laugh. Today we're going deep on Anton Chekhov's The Proposal. It's a one-act play. Um, you could basically call it a master class in, well, comedic absurdity, I guess. It really is fascinating how Chekhov takes, like, you know, this familiar scenario, a marriage proposal, and makes it into this hilarious satire of of societal expectations, really, yeah. and human nature. You think you're going to get, like, a love story, right? Oh, but right. instead you get three characters just locked in this this ridiculous battle of wits yeah, like, while hate. they're trying to be all, you know, proper. Exactly. He really nails it. That awkward tension between oh. like social conventions and I guess you could say our less refined instincts. Right. Um, so you have Lomov, our nervous bachelor. He's trying to propose to Natalia. She's the daughter of a wealthy neighbor. Mm -hmm. But things go south really quickly and they descend into these um, increasingly absurd arguments. It's funny because they argue over like the silliest things. Like, yeah. Like who cares whose hunting dog is better? Right. Or squeezer. Well, in Chekhov's world, right, like everything's a symbol. Yeah. He makes everything stand in for something bigger. So when they're bickering about their dogs, uh -huh. they're actually battling over pride, you know, and social standing. Okay. And like who has the upper hand in these marriage negotiations. Uh, so it's not about the dogs at all. Not really, no. It's about like all the underlying tension, yeah. all the insecurity, all the stuff that comes up when two families are trying to yeah. you know, force a marriage to happen. Precisely. And remember, it's we're talking about late 19th century Russia here. Right. Where marriage was like often seen as the strategic alliance uh -huh. to consolidate wealth and social status. You know, love and romance weren't always the like primary considerations. Which makes his play even more like... I don't know, brilliant. Yeah. Because he's using humor to, to like, expose how absurd these social norms are, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like they warp our behavior and make us focus on the wrong things. And it does it so cleverly. Yeah. Through farce, right. It's a style of comedy that uses um, 
exaggerated situations, yep. physical humor, and quick-witted dialogue, right? Yeah. All to create this sense of chaotic absurdity. Okay, so, like, picture this. You have Lomoth, who's a total hypochondriac, right? Right. And he's, like, sweating bullets trying to propose to Natalia, yeah. who's just as stubborn and quick-tempered as he is. Of course. And then you throw in her father... Chubikov, right. who's going back and forth between trying to make this marriage happen, but also getting caught up in the arguments. Oh, yeah. He can't help himself. It's a can't. recipe for, like, total comedic disaster. It is. It is. But it's also, I think, a brilliant way to show how easy it is to get sidetracked by our own egos. Mm -hmm. You know? Our need to be right, even when it comes to something huge like marriage. So is Chekhov saying that we should just, like, forget all social conventions hmm. and follow our hearts? I don't know if I'd go that far. I think he wants us to like look beyond the surface yep. to question those like deeply ingrained assumptions about what makes a good marriage mm -hmm. a happy life. You know, like he's reminding us that sometimes we get so focused on winning right. that we totally lose sight of what really matters. Genuine connection, empathy, understanding. He's making us laugh at these characters who are like, you know, yeah. mirrors of our own like human weirdness exactly we laugh at them but we also see ourselves in their struggles right? right and their insecurities and their tendency to to just blow things way out of proportion okay so we've got these societal expectations and checkoffs like masterful use of farce now let's um let's talk about the characters themselves oh yeah because yeah, they are something else they are they are each one is like this um, carefully constructed, I don't know, comedic archetype. Yeah. And together they create this hilarious and strangely relatable dynamic. Let's start with Natalia. She's not like your typical damsel in distress, is she? No, not at all. She's fiery, independent, and she can hold her own in an argument, that's for sure. But she's also like quick to jump to conclusions, yeah. you know, let her emotions get the best of her, which, you know, yeah. adds to the comedic chaos. I totally get her though. Mm. Like, who hasn't been on that emotional roller coaster? Right. Especially when you're trying to make like a big decision. Well, absolutely. One minute you're all excited, and then the next you're like, oh, wait, yeah. what am I doing? Exactly. And Chekhov captures those struggles so well. I mean, Natalia might be desperate to get married. Yeah. But she's also like fiercely protective of her independence. And not afraid to speak her mind, even if it means, you know, jeopardizing the whole proposal. Okay. And then there's Lomov, our bumbling hypochondriac. Yeah. I mean, this guy can't even get through a sentence without mentioning, you know, his palpitations or his limp. But but that's what makes him so fascinating, right? Like yeah. his hypochondria, it's more than just a physical thing. Yeah. It shows his deeper anxieties about marriage, you know? Uh, Social expectations, his own like insecurities. It's almost like his body is rebelling against getting married. Right. He's so like caught up in his own head. Yeah. That he he just sabotages himself at every turn. Exactly. And Chekhov uses that, that physical anxiety mm -hmm. to highlight how absurd these societal expectations are. Right. It's like, here's this guy who's supposed to be, you know, strong and decisive. Right. But he just crumbles under the pressure of this proposal. Right. And then you have Natalia's father, Chubukov, who just like adds another layer of comic mayhem. He does. He does. He's so desperate to marry off his daughter that he'll overlook anything. Yeah. Like every red flag. Anything. And he even encourages the arguments. Oh, yeah. Just to get them married. She's like, Dad, come on. I know. I know. But that's what makes him so great. He's like hilarious. Right. But also strangely endearing. I mean, he might be a bit of a schemer, but he loves his daughter. You know, he wants what's best for her, even if his methods are a little questionable. <laughs> yeah, he's like that classic middling parent, but um, with a Chekhovian twist, right? Yeah. I, I mean, his his eagerness to get Natalia married, right. even with all the craziness going on, it, it really speaks to like the societal pressures, yeah. the well, economic realities back then. Okay, so we've got these, you know, amazing characters, mm -hmm. each with their own like little quirks yeah. and, and, and motivations, right? Yeah. And they're just bouncing off each other in this like pressure cooker of proposal <laughs> yeah but let's let's talk about the arguments themselves okay because they're not just funny they're like insightful right no, absolutely yeah uh, Chekhov doesn't just use them for for cheap laughs mm -hmm. you know yeah. he he crafts them to reveal these deeper truths about human nature and the ways <laughs> we we kind of sabotage ourselves right. with our own pride and spimmerness and the most 
like I don't know iconic example of that yeah. is the argument over the oxen meadows, right? Yeah, I mean, it's just a tiny piece of land. Right. Why are they even getting yeah. worked up over it? I know. But for them, it's like this huge deal. It is. It is. And remember what we were saying about Chekhov using you know objects as symbols. Mm -hmm. Well, the oxen meadows. They're way more than just land. Okay. They represent like the need to be in control. Right. You know, to prove how much you're worth. Okay. To have something like solid. Yeah. When you're faced with this, this huge life decision. So they're so caught up in being right and mm -hmm. in winning. Yeah. That they forget about like the possibility of actually building a life together. Precisely. And that's the, the tragedy of it, right. but also the comedy, right? Yeah. He shows us how how easy it is to get distracted by these little fights how right. how our egos can can blind us to what really matters and it's so timeless you know it is like this play was written over a hundred years ago i know but it's like i can still see those arguments happening today oh absolutely like instead of oxen meadows maybe we're fighting over yeah i don't know housework or whose taste in movies is better Right, right. The details change, but the the core dynamic is the same. Yeah. We get so fixated on our point, uh -huh. on winning, that we forget that we're supposed to be on the same side. It's like a reminder to, like, choose your battles. Yeah. To let go of the little stuff mm -hmm. and, and focus on, you know, the connection. Exactly. And Chekhov does it with humor, right? Right. He makes us laugh, but he also yeah. makes us think it's, it's entertaining and thought-provoking. And speaking of humor... Mm -hmm. We can't forget about those dogs. Oh, yeah. Guess and Squeezer. Right. Those dogs, they're not just there for laughs. Yeah. They're like metaphors for the characters. Oh, okay. Wait, how so? Well, think about it. Lumoff and Natalia are constantly arguing about whose dog is better, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like who's got the better pedigree, yeah. whose dog is the better hunter. Right, right. But those arguments, they're, they're just like the one about the oxen meadows. Mm -hmm. They're hiding these deeper insecurities okay. and this need for validation. So the dogs are like extensions of their egos. Precisely. It's like they're saying, my dog's better than your dog, uh -huh. so I'm better than you. Which is like a totally ridiculous way to approach a relationship. It is. It is. <laughs> All about competition. Yeah. Right? Wow. Not about, you know, working together or respecting each other. Right. And Chekhov's using those dogs to to poke fun at us. Okay. At our need to compare ourselves to other people. Yeah. To to get validation from outside sources. Yeah. He's reminding us that. That real confidence. Mm -hmm. Real self-worth. Yeah. It comes from within. Right. Not from like your stuff or your pets. Exactly. It's amazing how much like depth I know. and meaning he puts into this like seemingly simple play. He really It's like every line. Yeah. Every interaction. Mm -hmm. It's got symbolism and social commentary. That's what makes him a master, you right, know. Right. He doesn't waste a word. Mm -hmm. Everything's there for a reason. He uses humor, satire, uh -huh. symbolism right. to create something that's entertaining but also really insightful. And it's so timeless. It is. The specifics might be different. Mm -hmm. We're not arguing about meadows and hunting dogs. Right. But the the core themes, the pride, yeah. Yeah. stubbornness, miscommunication. It's all still relevant. Yeah. Still and I think that's why the proposal is still performed all over the world right it's a play that that holds up a mirror to us yeah you know it reminds us to to have a sense of humor about ourselves mm -hmm. to be a little more humble in our relationship and to maybe like not start a fight over whose dog is cuter yeah unless unless you're doing it like as a Chekhovian satire, right? Then, then go for it. Let the arguments begin. All right. So we've talked okay. about the characters, the mm -hmm. arguments, yeah, the symbolism, it. right? But one thing that really struck me about this play, yeah, is how much it's about like the need for connection, even when we're really bad at expressing it. That's a that's a great point. I mean, with all the bickering and the absurdity, there's yeah. this this sense of like longing. Mm. vulnerability underneath yeah yeah they might drive each other crazy right but they're also drawn to each other maybe yeah. out of loneliness mm. or just you know societal pressure to get married it's like that tension between wanting to be close to someone yeah but also being afraid of getting hurt oh totally and Chekhov captures that so well yeah he shows us that even the most ridiculous arguments can mm -hmm. come from this this deep need right. to be seen to be heard to be loved it's like you know when you're arguing with your partner mm -hmm. about something stupid like who left the dishes in the sink right right 
But really, you're fighting about something much bigger. Exactly. And and Chekhov's telling us that sometimes yeah. the best way to deal with these these complicated feelings mm-hmm. is through humor. Okay. Laughter can can help, you yeah. know? Yeah. It can diffuse the tension, break down walls, right. and bring us closer together. So he's giving us permission to yeah. like laugh at ourselves yeah. at our own awkward attempts at, at connection. He's saying it's okay to be awkward. Mm. It's okay to be vulnerable, to make mistakes. That's all part of being human. And that's that's such a like freeing message. It is. Like it lets us be more playful in our relationships, mm. you know, to to embrace the craziness of it all. Yeah. And to remember that even when we're arguing, yeah, there's still the possibility for for love and laughter. Absolutely. And, and genuine connection. Exactly. So like yeah. even with all the craziness, there's hope for these characters. Right, right. And and that that leads us to one of the most, I think, important parts of this play. Pathos. Okay. It's that feeling you get, like, you know, pity or sympathy for the characters. So you get the humor and the satire. But yeah. how does he make us feel sorry for them? Mm-hmm. They're arguing about, like, nothing. Well, it's all in the details. He shows us their vulnerabilities. Okay. You know, their loneliness, their desire to be loved. Right. Like, take Lomov underneath all that, you know, blustering and hypochondria. Mm. He's... He's just an insecure guy who's yeah. scared of being alone. Yeah, I, I never thought of it that way. But yeah. you're right. All that worrying about his health, his limp. Right. It's it's all coming from somewhere deeper, right? Exactly. And Natalia, you know, she's independent, but yeah. she wants companionship. She mm. might be strong, but she's also like kind of naive about love mm-hmm. and marriage, which makes her, you know, vulnerable to Lomov's um, awkward attempts at romance. And and her father Chubukov. Yeah, he seems like a like a greedy, manipulative right. guy. Right, but but even he has moments where he's yeah. you know genuinely concerned for his daughter. He does, he does. Chekhov's showing us that they're not just you know funny characters. Right, they're they're real people well, with yeah. real emotions, real flaws. So so are we supposed to just laugh at them and and move on? I think Chekhov wants us to do more than that. Okay, he wants us to to really see them. You know, to yeah. see the humanity in all this craziness. Right. And to to maybe bring a little more empathy to our own relationships. So it's not just like a funny play. You no. Know, it's about like the human condition. Exactly. It's a reminder that we all have our, you know, our weird little things. Yeah. And that sometimes the best way to connect with people is to get, to admit that we're not perfect. And that's, that's a really important message, especially today. It is. It is. I mean, we're surrounded by these images of, you know, perfect relationships, mm-hmm. perfect lives. Right. It's easy to forget that real life is, well, messy. <laughs> yeah, it is. And complicated and, and often pretty funny. So the next time we're, like, getting all bent out of shape over, yeah. I don't know, who took out the trash. Right. We should, like, they could check off. Exactly. Remember Lomov and Natalia and their yeah. their fight over that little piece of land? Just, you know, take a step back. Mm. See how ridiculous it is. Right. And maybe even, like, laugh about it. Yeah. You'd be surprised how much that can help. That's a that's a great point. Yeah. It's, it's like, even though he was writing over 100 years ago. I know. He still gets us. He does. He does. The proposal, it just, it resonates with people. Yeah. Because it's about these, these universal truths, you know, mm-hmm. about love and relationships. Why? Well, the challenges of just, like, being human. Well, that brings us to the end of our deep dive into Anton Chekhov's The Proposal. It has. It's been, um... I don't know. Yeah. Wild. It has been a wild ride. Hilarious. Yeah. And and surprisingly insightful. It has been a pleasure, you know, exploring Chekhov's work with you. And a huge thank you to all of you out there listening. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed, you know, laughing along with us and that you'll, Mm -hmm. you'll leave with a new appreciation for, for humor Mm -hmm. and, and the, the absurdity of, of life and love. And maybe, just maybe, the next time you're in an argument about something silly, yeah, you'll think of Lomov and Natalia, right, and and smile instead of you know letting it get to you. Until next time.